morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Today is Tuesday, July 18th, 2023. We are here in the hearing room on the first floor in Fort Collins for the, at the Alarma County Administrative Services Building for our administrative matters meeting for the Alarma County Board of County Commissioners. I call this meeting to order. Please, um, we're gonna start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for joining us with the pledge. And good morning, again, welcome to everyone, um, for all those online and also those in the audience today. Um, I am Larimer County Commissioner Jody scheibig Chair of the Board of County Commissioners. Joining me today at the dais are my colleagues, Larimer County Commissioner Kristen Stevens and Larimer County Commissioner John Kafalis. Also joining us today is our clerk to the board, Tessa Beatty. Good morning, Tessa. Thanks for all your work for the board. Our county manager, Lorenda Volker, from our public information office and uh, history buff extraordinaire, Tom Clayton, and Sarah Martin from our commissioner's office who helps us with our schedule and, and our um, boards and commissions and lots of other important things for the board of county commissioners. We welcome you all and thank you for your work today. Um, we have uh, now our public comment portion of the meeting. We have a couple of people that have signed up. Um, and do we have anybody online, Sarah, just to kind of a heads up for me? Nobody online. Okay, so we have now public comment. Um, you will have three minutes if you will approach the dais and introduce yourself and where you're from. And um, you would have three minutes. We'll help you keep the time up there. So I would invite Richard Seaworth to come forward to the podium and introduce yourself where you're from and thank you for coming for our public comment sir okay well thank you for having me uh, i'm richard seaworth uh, i want to talk to you about the the floodplain in larimer county uh, my property is 2705 east county road 70. in 1989 i got a letter from fema said that my feed yard was in the floodplain so I hired a engineering firm by the name of Howdy Ship, who had done a lot of engineering work on the Box Elder. And they sent me a map and a letter that I sent to FEMA and I thought everything was cured in 1997. Later that year, I got a visit from the FBI. They came in, wanted to know where I got the letter. Mr. Howdy Shell eventually lost his license and he went to jail. So you don't mess around with these floodplains. So at that time, I hired the heirs. Heirs did the work for me. They sent me a map revision, which is what you get. I sent that on to FEMA. FEMA sent me a letter of that it was acceptable and it was done in 2007. And here's the map revision that was done and the original map. And I was informed at that time that back during the Depression in the 1930s, they hired some people to arbitrarily make maps. And you have to do these revisions to get them corrected. So let's fast forward to June of 2023. I call in and ask, make an appointment with your planning commission. And I asked if I can make, upgrade a house that I have. And the lady was very nice. Said, oh, yeah, you have more than enough acres. You can do what you want, except you're in the floodplain. Now, I'm sorry, but if you can't bring your uh, stuff up to date from 2007 to today, and what makes it even worse, Larimer County itself did a, another map revision of my property to do the roundabout at the corner of 9 and 70 two years ago. And your people don't know about this. So this cost me two or three weeks of my time to get this all straightened out. And today they still don't know in planning and zoning. Your planning and zoning does not know what the rest of the county's doing. And I don't understand why you can't bring them up to speed, but I really think you should. Thank you, sir, for okay. your public comment. And thank you for coming today. So Sarah, is there anyone else online? 
Okay. So I will ask anyone in the audience, and we have a lot of folks in the audience today. It's great to see you all. But would anyone at this time like to come up and make public comment? You're welcome to just come up and state your name, and you would have three minutes. Okay, um, none have taken that offer, so I will now close public comment. Um, we have started something that we try to do just to see if my colleagues uh, want to um, make some comments about public comment. And so um, I will um, start with Commissioner Stevens if you'd like to respond to public comment today, Commissioner. Yeah, just th thank you for your presentation um, or thank you for letting us know about your situation. Certainly we can get you in contact with staff to, to potentially figure out some of your issues, but um, if you would want to send us an email or, um, you know, we, or give us a phone call, we'll get you in touch with staff to see if we can resolve any of your issues. But thanks for letting us be aware of that. And I know some of this is confusing and it, you're right, I think things change and, and people clearly change and sometimes people lose their positions. And so it, it isn't something to mess around with, but we certainly want to get it right um, and help you understand what we're doing on our end. So I'm happy to have those conversations. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Kafalas. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Richard, thanks for your uh, participation this morning. I appreciate the relationship that we've uh, developed over the years and, and your engagement in um, the northern part of Latimer County, you know, certainly County Road 70, and, and all the work you've done over the years as a farmer. Um, our Community Planning Infrastructure and Resources Director, I'm sure, is taking notes of your comments, and as my fellow Commissioner, Stevens indicated, um, I'm sure they'll be they'll follow up with you to make sure that the planning and the county engineering folks are all working together to address any of your concerns. Thank you, Richard. Good to see you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Richard, I want to thank you for coming today and again participating in public comment. Um, we really want to hear from the public and we appreciate um, folks who do come down to the office and be in front of us. I want to thank you for um, for speaking for your frustrations and concerns. Um, I, I see our directors in the audience. I will make sure I have your information here on the sign-in sheet. I will get that to her immediately so that they can reach out. And um, I appreciate your frustrations and um, I've um, driven around your neighborhood and visited some of those ranches and I want to just um, thank you for your long-term com commitment to agriculture and that industry and uh, appreciate you bringing this to our attention so thank you very much for your time today so with that um, we'll move on and um, appreciate everyone um, participating in public comment today we now have approval of the minutes colleagues did you have any um, additions changes or um, edits you'd like to do for the um, minutes Okay, well, with that, Commissioner Kafals, I would welcome a motion to approve the minutes, please. Uh, yes, I move to approve the minutes for the week of July 10th, 2023. Thank you for that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, moving on. Um, Sarah, we will, uh, let's review our upcoming schedule. This is the commissioner's schedule for July 24th to the 29th, 2023. On Monday, July 24th, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Commissioner Stevens will attend the National Association of Counties Annual Conference in Austin, Texas. From 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m., there will be a work session with Leslie Ellis, Director of Community Planning, Infrastructure, and Resources, in the commissioner's conference room on the second floor. From 2.30 p.m. to 3 p.m., there will be an executive se session pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute 2464024A for a discussion regarding the purchase and acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of any real or personal property interest in the Commissioner's Conference Room on the second floor. On Tuesday, July 25th, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., there will be an administrative matters meeting in the hearing room on the first floor. From 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m., there will be administrative direction to county management in the Sprague Lake Conference Room on the second floor. From 3.30 p.m. to 5 p.m., Commissioner Shattuck McNally may attend the rodeo board meeting at the Thomas M. McKee 4-H Youth and Community Building at 5280 Arena Circle in Loveland. On Wednesday, July 26th, from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., Commissioners Kapalas and Shattuck McNally may attend the North Fort Collins Business Association meeting at the Rocky Mountain Innisfere at 320 East Vine Drive in Fort Collins.
from 8.45 a.m. to 9.15 a.m., Commissioner Stevens will attend the new employee orientation in the hearing room on the first floor. From 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., commissioners, there will be a commissioner's casual conversation in the commissioner's conference room on the second floor. From 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m., there will be a work session regarding preliminary 2024 to 2029 strategic plan goals in the commissioner's conference room on the second floor. From 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., commissioners may attend the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Board meeting at the Poudre River Conference Room at 200 Paradot Avenue in Loveland. From 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., Commissioner Stevens may attend the Fair Board meeting at 5280 Arena Circle in Loveland. On Thursday, July 27th, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., Commissioner Shattuck McNally will participate in the Virtual Colorado Forest Health Council meeting. From 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m., Commissioner Cavallis will host a community conversation for the Red Feathers Lake community at 58 Firehouse Lane at Red Feather Lakes. The guest will be Joshua Fudge, Larimer County Director of Performance, Strategy, and Budget, and Larimer County Assessor Bob Overbeck, who will discuss how property tax ballot measures could impact the county budget and how Larimer County process protests and notice of determination. From 1.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m., Commissioner Kafalis will attend the Red Feather Lakes Planning Advisory Committee meeting. It's a hybrid meeting. In person, it will be at 44 Firehouse Lane at Red Feather Lakes or virtually via Zoom. From 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m., Commissioner Shattuck McNally will attend the Regional Opioid Abatement Council meeting. It's a hybrid meeting. In person, it'll be at 200 Paradot Avenue in Loveland or virtually via Zoom. From 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., Commissioner Shattuck McNally may attend the Open Lands Advisory Board meeting in the Poudre River Conference Room at 200 Paradot Avenue in Loveland. On Friday, July 28th, from 8 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., Commissioner Stevens will participate in the Virtual Colorado Department of Human Services Trails Executive Steering Committee meeting. From 8.30 a.m. to 9.20 a.m., Commissioner Shattuck McNally may participate in the Virtual Forest Health Council Legislative Committee meeting. From 12 p.m. to 2 p.m., commissioners will host a luncheon for Colorado State Representatives in the Commissioner's Conference Room on the second floor. And on Saturday, July 29th, from 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m., the commissioners will participate in the Larimer County Fair and Rodeo Parade at the Fairgrounds Park at 700 South Railroad Avenue in Loveland. That's it. Thank you, Sarah, for that. I appreciate that. It's uh, getting close to fair and rodeo time, getting really excited. I hope you're all applying to attend. There's lots of extra special things happening this year. Colleagues, do you have any additions or changes to the schedule? Commissioner Stevens. Yeah, um, thank you, Sarah. The only addition that I have is that I have a non-attainment area air pollution mitigation enterprise governing board meeting um, on Thursday, um, July uh, 27th from 3 to 4.30. So it, the abbreviation is NAPME, N-A-A-P-M-E. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I don't have any additions. Um, um, except that when you say I may attend the, force, the legislative meeting, I will be because I chair that meeting and we're working really hard on legislation already for next year regarding force health and um, we've been meeting almost every week. We've done a lot of work, so um, I don't get to May with that. So, But thank you, Sarah. Appreciate all the work that you do. Our schedules are um, very full. All of us are working really hard. Um, so now we'll move on to the consent. Whoops. Commissioner Guess. No commissioner guests today on the schedule. Anybody have anyone they've invited for today? Okay, so we'll move on from, up. Oh, sorry, the consent agenda. Um, just wanted to make sure there wasn't uh, something for commissioner's guests. So the consent agenda is now um, our next item and the consent agenda consists of items of no perceived controversy and routine administrative actions, such as abatements, agreements, deeds, uh, final plats, liquor licenses, uh, and other matters previously reviewed by the Board of County Commissioners. And staff recommends approval of the consent agenda. And a commissioner may request that an item be pulled off the agenda considered separately. Items pulled from the agenda will be considered after the Board has takes action on the remainder of the consent agenda. So I will now read at a high level the consent agenda. For those who would like to get more information about anything that is included on the consent agenda, um, you can go to larimer.org um, or do, the gov and go to our Board of County Commissioners um, page, all of our agendas and more in-depth details, along with our meeting schedules, um, our emails, our contact information, and all kinds of great information is on that website. But again, the, the details of the consent agenda 
are on that um, page. So now I will read these um, items. We have, last week had a pretty long agenda. This one's um, a lot shorter than last week's. So I'll just, again, read briefly. We have a agreement, an intergovernmental agreement between Larimer County Department of Human Services and Estes Park School District R3, Pooter School District R1, and Thompson School District R2J. And, the, and this is an agreement um, for the Estes Park School District, the Poder School District, the Thompson School District to provide school transportation services to children and youth in foster care to ensure school stability and academic success. And we appreciate and are grateful for that important partnership. We have two appointments. We have appointments to the Equity, Diversity, Inclusionary Advisory Board. Congratulations to Savannah, Vishvesh, and Luis. We also have recommendations of reappointments to the Bruns Public Improvement District. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter, for your service. We have liquor licenses. Um, we have the liquor license special event, 6% of home builders for the Home Builders Association of no Northern Colorado for a Fort Collins event. And we also have miscellaneous um, items of the one is the 360 Linden LLC stipulation as to tax year 2022 value. We have the uh, item two is a treasurer's six month report submitted by our treasurer and public trustee, Irene Josie. And this report is for the time period of January 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2020, 2023. And this report will be published in a legal newspaper within Larimer County within 60 days of June 30th, 2023. Number three is the approval to enter upon, approval to enter upon lands. Um, uh, submitted by our natural resources for wind mitigation. We have a quest for approval to enter upon lands um, to do an, another weed lo, uh, mitigation. Um, and then we have um, five and six are also approval to enter upon lands um, submitted by uh, Mr. Saners from our uh, weed mitigation from natural resources. And those areas are um, in Estes and looks like Fort Collins and other folks. And then we have one more, another on item seven is a request for approval to enter upon lands by, for weed mitigation by our natural resources. We also have eight, which is the paid parking for the Budweiser Event Center submitted by Conrad Grant and Mark Tinkelberg. And starting August 19th, 2023, Oak View Group um, venue management will implement a paid parking model for all events at the event center using a free flow model. And you can um, go learn more about this on our website. Um, nine is the annual compliance certification report, monitoring and permit deviation report submitted by our solid waste department. And this is a annual and semi-annual reports required by the landfills air emissions permit, which is um, a federally enforceable title five operating permit and um, currently the landfill is in compliance and all other permit conditions. Resolution um, um, is our last item, providing for the appointment of an additional independent referees to conduct hearings on behalf of the Larimer County Board of Equalization for 2023, submitted by our operations manager. Colleagues, um, do you have any items you wish to pull or um, off the uh, consent agenda? Commissioner Kofalis. Uh Thanks, Madam Chair. I don't have any consent agenda items that I wish to remove from the consent agenda for discussion. I would like to make a statement uh, for the public, and that is that we're having internet issues, and therefore we're not able to live stream this meeting. Uh, I think folks should be aware of that. Um, but we, will, we are recording the meeting, and it will be made available. Uh, after the meeting through our YouTube channel, I was informed by a constituent that they couldn't get on. Um, thank you, C Commissioner, for that. And I appreciate the public's patience as we navigate a transition to a new um, audio and visual system. And we appreciate our partners' hard work and, and efforts to kind of work us through this, con um, this transition. So um, thank you, Commissioner. So with that, Commissioner Stevens, I would welcome a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. Yes, Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda for July 18th, 2023. Thank you for that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. And we've already established that we do not have any um, Commissioner's guests. Um, colleagues, I will have a guest on August 8th. I'm going to confirming that before I um, uh, let you know who's coming, but we will have a nice presentation on that day. Um, 
number one, um, and it's hopefully going to be the U.S. Forest Service. Um, so um, our discussion items, we have uh, some really important and outstanding discussion items today. We have six of them, all very exciting and great things to celebrate today. So right now I'd like to welcome our Public Health Director, Tom Gonzalez, to the podium for a discussion item on the Department of Health and Environment Award, um, was awarded the 2023 Model Practice Award from the National Association of City and County Officials. Um, this is really a big deal. Um, I want to just quickly just state how proud I am. Um, and this award is from work that was going on even before COVID, during and through and after COVID and to receive a national award um, focusing on our staff driven and our hardworking staff who have done so much work um, throughout the pandemic and the subsequent recovery and as we establish strong resiliency and advance some of these really big initiatives like the community mapping and things um, are, I think it's just outstanding and I want to just um, again, just talk about how this is a very prestigious award, this model practice award by the National Association of City and County Health Officials. Um, and this is for our um, your your department and their, your team's successful development and implementation of innovation strategies to strengthen the local public health force through intentional practices to improve life work balance, promote a sense of belonging with the organization, address training gaps, and ultimately decrease staff burnout and turnover, which, um, you know, I always say we're a great county because of our staff. And without our staff, we don't get things done. And that's our secret sauce is we have amazing staff employees who deliver services to our residents and work collaboratively together. And so to get this award is huge. And I want to just thank you, Director. And you know, now I'll turn it over to you. I just wanted to say how excited I was to learn and read about that <laughs> award. So thank you. Well, Thank you and good morning and thanks for your enthusiasm. I appreciate that. Good morning, board and county manager Volker. Tom Gonzalez, public health director. I have several of our colleagues here today, uh, but we do have Talia Hirsch, who's our strategic planning and equity initiatives program supervisor with me today that'll give us a presentation. She presented uh, this presentation last week at the National Association of City County Health Officials and she did a tremendous job, so we thought we would share that with you as well. Uh, as you said, this is a prestigious award. I've been at this since 1996, started here with Larimer County on my journey, which is two states, four local public health agencies, and along the way, submitted for model practice awards and never won one until now. So that's how difficult it is. There's over 3,000 local public health agencies in the country. And only about a dozen of these awards are given through the National Association of City County Health Officials every year. So it is an extreme honor. And we're told that it, it goes through an, a peer reviewed panel that spends many, many hours reviewing all the applications to select the top model practices. And that rigorous process must Coming out of that process, your your program must demonstrate exemplary and replicable initiatives to promote public health. So that's a key piece, and Talia you will go over that. Where I'm proud is we have 115 people that make up the Department of Health and Environment, and we are a people organization. Every day we're touching people's lives. Every day we're trying to promote public health, extend life and healthy life and create healthy options and opportunities and reduce barriers that otherwise creates inequities. I'm so proud of our team, they do that every day. And over the pandemic, they continue to do that while standing up to protect our hospital systems and our community from COVID-19. So it is truly an honor to receive such a prestigious award during such a difficult time. Um, Again, I'm just proud of the whole team, all their efforts, and how they truly impact the lives of Larimer County residents and visitors every day. And with that, I'll turn it over to Talia to present on the program, the award-winning program. So, Talia? Thank you. Welcome, Talia. 
Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Talia Hirsch, and as Tom said, I'm the Strategic Planning and Health Equity Initiatives Program Supervisor um, at the Health Department. And as Tom said, this was really a team effort. So I have the honor of presenting it, but it definitely wasn't done alone or in silos. It took everyone to really come together and rally behind investing in our staff. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I think all of you know that the pandemic caused high levels of stress, burnout, and anxiety in the public health workforce. And like many other health departments, we recognize this and we realized that we really had to do something about it. We noticed this not only in our day-to-day, -day, but through the county employee survey that comes out every year, where our staff reported increased feelings of burnout, anxiety, depression, and a decreased feeling of community. Um, so these things don't lead to good outcomes, and so we wanted to make sure um, to create a plan. Go to the next slide. So that's what we did. Um, next slide. Perfect. Um, so our first objective in this plan was increasing our staff's ratings of work-life balance and the amount of work is reasonable on the annual employee survey. Um, we really took this as an opportunity to listen and learn. Um, and I have to give Shan, who's in the audience, a big shout out for this one. She led the charge with what we call discovery interviews, where we, every supervisor sat down with every staff member and asked them, what's going on with work-life balance? How are you feeling? How can we better support you? And then we took all that feedback back and created strategic initiatives from there to really make sure that our staff were feeling supportive and that we were able to help them reach that work-life balance that we all want. Um, the next thing is that we wanted to create a new onboarding and all staff um, new employee orientation. So Liv and Braun in the audience had a lot to do with that. So thank you to them. Um, and we created this new employee orientation and made all of our staff go through it. So anyone who had been there for 30 years, five years, knew we wanted them to go through it because we were really trying to shift our culture. We wanted them to understand our values, our vision, our mission, what we were trying to create um, and really um, help people get to know each other and increase that sense of community. I think that was one of the bigger things that came out of it. We also had all of our leadership team members come in and present. So they got to know the staff better. Our staff got to know our decision makers um, and just create a better community. Um, the next objective was to make staff feel valued by investing in their professional development. So we created a training fund where all staff got $300 to spend on any training of their choosing. Um, this uh, fund also had funds in there for staff to come and say, our team really needs this training or we really need to do some team building. Um, and it's been super successful. Um, one of the bigger trainings that's come out of it is our uh, environmental health team told us that they needed cultural humility training. So they, um, we helped them find a trainer and bring that in so that they could better serve the community. Um, and lastly, we wanted to significantly reduce our staff separations rates. They had gotten really high during COVID and we wanted to, we were hoping that everything that I previously talked about would help us bring those down. Um, and then, so we also wanted to make sure that equity was really embedded in all this. We learned a lot of lessons through the pandemic and truly wanted to make sure that internally we were doing everything we could to make sure our staff felt like they belonged and that they were included. Um, so we offered interpretation services throughout our orientation for any staff where English wasn't their preferred language. We also, during orientation, have a section on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can't talk about everything, but we do want to make sure that our staff understand how it relates to their work and why it's one of our values. Um, and lastly, our health equity initiatives um, program, uh, program coordinator met with a lot of teams to talk to them about what barriers they were facing in the community and what trainings we could bring into them or how we could help them just problem solve and think innovatively about solutions. Um, I do also really want to thank, as I said, it's a team effort. So we have an Invest in Our People work group, which is made up of staff from across the department. Um, Everyone in there is working on various projects from bi-directional communication to making sure our staff feel safe um, to bringing in lunch and learn. So this team of staff um, from all levels of the organization really have come together and helped make sure that we're creating a work environment that everyone enjoys and thrives in. Um, so the outcomes. So 
we uh, increased our ratings on the employee survey for the amount of work is reasonable by 5% and work-life balance by 10% from 2020 to 2022. And these um, ratings were actually even higher than they were in 2019. We also have had, it's probably a bigger number than that because we just had our uh, orientation two weeks ago, but 75% of staff at least have attended our new employee orientation. Um, and we also did pre and post surveys on orientation to make sure that our staff really understood the mission, visions, values. Everybody came away um, with a better understanding as well as a better understanding of our leadership and what to do in an emergency um, and a better sense of belonging. We've also invested nearly $25,000 in the last two years on professional development just through this fund. So there's been other professional development trainings and things, but this fund, which is really staff driven, has we've invested in. And then we've decreased our separation rate by 5.7%. Um, so these are just some photos of some of our all staff get togethers. Um, the biggest thing we really have for us, because we want to make sure this is sustainable moving forward, is that we really have buy-in across the department. Everybody in the department is invested in each other, in the staff, in making a better community. So that's really great. We also have budget lines for all of these. So we're going to continue new employee orientation. We're going to continue the training fund. Um, and then our supervisors are encouraged to continue having these conversations about work-life balance with their staff moving forward. Um, and then we learned from staff that they wanted more time to connect. So we've planned an all staff development day. We've been doing a Christmas party every year, just really giving staff that opportunity to have fun during work. Um, and yes, yeah, so we're just committed to listening and learning from our staff in years to come and are excited to, com to continue to invest in them as we move forward. Thank you so much for that presentation. I appreciate all the photos and all the smiles. Um, I'm kind of envious. It looks like a lot of fun. So, and it's always nice to, especially with the things, conditions you've went through, to have that time to debrief and kind of, you know, um, connect and share each other and lift each other up. It was very, very challenging time. And to win this and have those separations rates go down during COVID and the pandemic is absolutely outstanding and just something to really celebrate. Um, Congratulations to all of you. Um, I'm sure Tom has some more things you'd like to share. Um, and then if, unless I will open it up for colleagues, uh, my, co my comments from my colleagues, don't go anywhere because I'm sure we might have questions. So. Well, I want to tell you to show off the cool award. Oh, yeah. We're going to take a picture with the cool award. There it is. Awesome. And that will go in our little trophy case at our Blue Spruce campus. So we are very, very proud of it. And I'm hoping you'll put it on social media so the public oh, can see. Oh, yeah. Corey's going to have that all. Coming out. Is Corey so, yes. here? She's not. She's okay. in the water world today doing work-life balance. Good for her. Yes. It, on a day as hot as today, that's probably yeah. a great, a great <laughs> place be to there. be. Well, um, Tom, I'm going to see if my colleagues have some questions. I mean, we're all giggling and, and, and celebrating, but this is really a big deal. So, Thank you. Commissioner um, Stevens, did you have some comments or questions? I don't think I have any questions. Just want to say congratulations on the award. And um, certainly the award is nice, but I think making these changes in your department is even nicer. You know, um, we, we know what you've gone through, or we've at least experienced some of what you've gone through uh, during the COVID. Um, I appreciate the fact that you and your staff remained firm and did the work that needed to be done, including getting folks vaccinated and really getting good messaging about and educating people. So um, that was remarkable work. So. Um, understand that people would be uh, burnt out after that and that you would lose people as um, as the grind got just a little too much and the and the some of the pushback in the community got a little too much but um, here here we are and we um, you know while it's not quite over exactly I think the emergency piece of it is is over and so um, I'm glad you're concentrating on on taking care of the people your staff and these seem like re really remarkable things to, I mean, investing in your staff is really important. We've seen similar efforts in human services where they've seen burnout with their staff as well. And, and they've enacted some of these, some similar programming and it's, it's made a remarkable difference. So I'm really glad that um, you and your staff are, are concentrating on this because we know that there's, there's other things around the bend that we and we don't, we're not sure what those things are, but your dedication to public health and your uh, ability to keep going through some really difficult times was really remarkable and and uh, really glad that your staff is 
taking the time now to take a little breather, get get the rest and the time that they need, get the training that they need, and um, really gearing up for whatever is around the bend. But thank you for your work. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Kafalis. Thank you. I have a comment and a question for Talia. My comment is um, building on what Commissioner Stevens said. Thank you for a work well done. Um, a reminder that one of our six guiding principles is that within our Larimer County organization, uh, we create a culture and environment where folks feel a sense of belonging, where there's inclusivity, uh, where there's a proper balance in terms of work life. And so this is really adhering to one of those those guiding principles. and. Um, I think we're very fortunate that there's such a commitment uh, to ensuring that it's a good place for folks to work and, and feel respected and, and um, their input matters. My question is uh, regarding a bi-directional communication, what is your understanding definition of bi-directional communi communication perhaps as it is applied within the Department of Health and Environment? Yeah, that's a great question. So we really wanted to make sure that we were hearing the voices of staff at all levels um, so that when staff had feedback, there were channels for them to tell their supervisor and for their supervisor to tell their supervisor and then also vice versa. When there's big announcements, we want to make sure that we're not just telling one person and that they're not hearing it. So we want to make sure that it's trickling down the chain of command um, in a quick and easy to easy to digest way. Um, so we've really worked hard as a management and leadership team to come together and improve our communications. And then we've also um, created a bi-directional communication plan to help staff better understand the chain of command and also some tips and tricks for if you're having some issues with a colleague, here are some ways you can here are some ways you can go about handling that. Or if you have a great idea, here's are the channels that you can tell um, that you can go through to get your ideas heard. We also just launched something that we're calling fresh ideas, where staff can go in and say, hey, here's an idea, here's how it links to our guiding principles. And then and people in the Invest in Our People work group get those ideas and they're able to share it with our quality improvement team or our leadership team or our management team, depending on where that idea would best be served. Thank you for answering my question, Talia. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so I'll just add on quick. I don't want to be too repetitive with my colleagues and I've already made some comments, but Aaliyah and team, especially all that you came today, um, you already have duties as a sign, which is a lot. And then I, I'm assuming and I'm thinking these are all probably above and beyond duties as a sign, which um, is we have almost I, I don't know too many employees who don't go above and beyond duties as a sign, which is just amazing, outstanding. And, and as a commissioner, just really uplifting and kind of, you know, helps us kind of fill up our boats that we're all working together and. And it's uh, see your investment in your peers and colleagues and, and your whole team is I saw that long list of names. I recognize some of those names. It just is, is really commendable. And, and Tom, that's to your leadership and all the work that you're doing to kind of allow the employees to have this flexibility and kind of develop these programs. And I like that comment about the bi-directional communication. That's uh, really important. And it's it's team building. Um, to help, as Commissioner Stevens said, to help you do your work for the residents of Larimer County, for, you know, and you guys really fight and believe in the safety, health, and welfare of our residents. And it's a really important work. And in the last few years, it's been um, public health and public health department has risen to a whole new level of awareness and what you do. But this is work you've been doing all along. Um, and the pandemic to provide some extra challenges. And I, um, I'm i sure some of you have worked in this space for a long time. So thank you for your dedication and commitment. Um, I think um, this is really outstanding work. And again, I, I give you credit for, all of you credit for reducing the amount of separations during a very stressful time. I'm not sure any other um, counties across the state can really say that. I think they've all had, you know, this whole um, time in our lives has been stressful on all of us, but especially those in public health. So I want to just, um, again, 
um, just say congratulations. Well done. Um, you guys live every day, our guiding principles, and it's um, just really proud. Take great pride in our public health department and all of you and the work that you do. And when I go out to festivals and stuff all summer, there's always a public health um, booth and you guys are interacting with the public and you're always smiling and have all these great little chopsticks and things on the desk and people just it's great to see people want to come up and engage and have conversations with you and, and it doesn't go unnoticed I just wanted to tell you that um, that's why I purposely come by because I want to say thank you and see what you're up what you're doing and watch the interaction so um, I want to thank you for that public outreach as well because I know you guys are every I see you everywhere so um, with that I want to um, Again, just how prestigious this is, congratulations. Um, I will ask Lorenda now, because I know she probably has some things she'd like to add um, about uh, comments for Tom and the team. Uh, thank you. So Tom, you and I have talked a lot about this privately offline because it's such a big deal. I guess I will say thank you for your thoughtful leadership, for really involving the team, for listening, for asking the right questions, and turning those into actions. Um, this is a work of many, um, and your leadership let it happen. And so thank you to you, thank you to, the, to Talia, and thank you to the whole team. Uh, um, I think the turnover numbers speak for themselves, especially after COVID. It's quite an accomplishment, and um, you have a, a fantastic team. This just demonstrates it to the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you. I, I did one. You, you know, when you're in public servant and role and, and you're – making decisions that are difficult, that you're looking at the, the best uh, for the uh, community, that can be challenging. And we've turned that in to be um, where we, we, we make it fun. And with the culture we've set up is that bi-directional, that we provide feedback to each other and we listen. And that's key. And I really give a shout out to all my colleagues there, the health department, all the staff, that really have embraced that. I hear the, the feedback and they give me feedback. And it only makes us better. If we don't take it defensively, we listen, we learn and improve, we all get better. And I'm starting to see that culture just day to day throughout the organization. Uh, and we get feedback from the community and that's important too, because people will disagree and we wanna hear why. So we can learn and, and ultimately make better decisions. So it's its ultimately the staff, but our management team, they're the ones that drive the organization. Leadership team sets the tone and the vision. Management team drives the organization and they've driven this organization are doing amazing things that, you know, I just get out of the way and sit back and go, wow, look at what we're doing. And then I watch the staff as they're just excited to roll up their sleeves and do the work. So it's many, it's all the folks over there, the ones that are really in the trenches per se, really motivating the staff, encouraging the staff. And, and it's great to work for such a supportive organization as Larimer County Government, where you have Nectar recognition, you have Employee of the Month, you have these recognitions that mean a lot. Somebody can say, wow, they really care, they're recognizing me. So it's the foundation being here at Larimer County. Again, I said three states, four counties. I came back here for a reason, because of that foundation and because of the people that make up this wonderful county. So thank you. Um, thank you, Tom. I couldn't agree more. And um, so now if the public will indulge us, I think I think this is a huge deal. We need a photo op. I want to um, thank you all for being here today. So I welcome you all up to come take a photo. We'll pause just for a moment and take a photo and celebrate this really prestigious award. And again, congratulations. Well-deserved recognition. Thank you. Good job again. Pausing for a moment as we took a photo to uh, celebrate this prestigious award that the, the uh, Department of Health and Environment was awarded the 2023 Model Practice Award from the National Association of City and County Health Officials. A big deal. Um, so now we're moving on to another big deal um, and really exciting. Um, and we have, we received a little thing on our dais, a little um, a really cute uh, thing celebrating that um, we have. Um, well, we're here to do recognition of the 40th Government Finance Officer Certificate of Achievement. This marks the 40th consecutive year that Larimer County has applied and received this award. 
And I'd like to invite Carol Block, and, and is Lori here today too? Lori Lopez, there she is, um, to come up. And this is, uh, you know, Larimer County was awarded, um, again, a certific Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for last year's Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, an ACRFR. FR, excuse me, the county is required by the state statute to produce an annual report and have it audited by an independent CPA firm. But as usual, Larimer County goes beyond this minimum requirement by also submitting its report to the Government Finance Officers Association Certificate Program. And all this work is done by these two amazing ladies in front of me, Carol Block and Lori Lopez. So Carol, I'll let you proceed. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I am Carol Block, and I have the responsibility and privilege of being the county's finance director. And the finance department consists of four divisions, sales tax, purchasing, um, risk management, and accounting. And accounting is the subject of the award today. And this award was uh, received under the leadership of our controller, Lori Lopez. And I just wanted to point out, Lori, I'm going to turn this over to Lori, but Lori has been responsible for the county's financial statements for 17 years, and she's been involved in producing them for 22 years. So of that 40 years that we've received this award, Lori has contributed to almost half of those years. So I'll turn that over to her. Thank you, Carol. Um, Welcome, Lori, and um, outstanding work. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, first of all, want to start off by saying this is a team effort. Um, we have an amazing group of people in finance who are very skilled with government re reporting requirements, which is unique. Yeah, um, and it's a special skill set. But also, we've developed really um, great relationships with our departments. And without our department staff, this would not be possible. So I want to start off by saying that. Um, we feel it's important to go that extra step because it, it provides transparency and full disclosure so our users can um, make the decisions that they need to make based on the, the transparent information that we provide. Um, and I wanted to kind of just go through and kind of compare and contrast 40 years ago to today. Here's a copy of the financial report from 40 years ago, 1982. And from what I understand, um, they used to have somebody photo this or, or draw it. It's actually drawn, a drawn picture by someone. We use photographs today. Um, but I just want to go through some, some comparables. So the, the Larimer County population increased by 130% since 1982. There was 160,000 folks here, and now there's 367. Um, school enrollment in our county was 25,082 and is 46,000 today. Um, the top two taxpayers in 82 were Hewlett Packard and Mountain Bell. And today they are Kara McGee, which is oil and gas, and Avago. The number of building permits issued in 1982 was 1,088, and today it's 4,252. Um, and I really got a kick out of the general fund um, revenues and expenses. So in, in 1982, the, ge the general fund um, received $14 million in revenue, and today we received $169 million. And the expenses were twelve million, and then now they're one hundred and fifty one so so we it's it's incredible how it's changed, but there's also been some similarities so um, back in nineteen eighty two there was a disaster relief um, fund created, and it was created when the lawn lake dam above Estes Park failed and so um, again, the amounts are a little different um, quite quite a bit more today that we have. Um, and our capital assets back in, in 1982 were 21 million. And capital assets are land and buildings and, and equipment. And today we reported um, 990 million. So that, I just thought this was very interesting to go through these, um, these stats with you and some significant events that happened um, around that time. In January 1st of 1981, a one cent, one year sales tax passed to fund construction of a jail. 
and we're just wrapping up a project for, for a jail uh, improvement project. Um, the total cost was expected to be $9 million for that jail. Um, in 1982, a one cent six month sales tax passed for the acquisition of 2,000 acres of land, which would become Horsetooth Mountain Park. So it's, it's very, very interesting to read. I'm also trying to drum up some readership for our um, report. It's lengthy, so I'll, you know, highlight the important parts of that, some interesting facts. Um, some new challenges that were mentioned. Um, Again, they, they struggled um, to find funding for streets, um, road repairs and maintenance, and they were also struggling um, with finding, you know, money for the health and human services programs. And then they were also struggling to find a um, public facility to house the courts. So some things are a little different, but some things kind of, you know, came back around. Um, but. That's all I had. I just wanted to highlight some of those differences and make sure that we give credit to the full team that um, is involved in preparing this report. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity of doing this. It's very near and dear to me and I just absolutely love doing this. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. And I have to say, um, I really enjoyed your comparison. That was really interesting. I might ask you for some of that data. Um, of course, I love that, um, the, showing some things are still the same and then showing some of the changes. I might ask for some of that data because I find it just fascinating. So thank you for adding that and um, just um, outstanding work. Thank you so much for working for the county and you and your team. I always say there's, I, again, I repeat it, we talked about the secret sauce or how a lucky commissioner I am, but the staff in this organization um, make my day Brilliant, beautiful. It's it's just such an honor to work alongside all of you. And I'm so thankful for your passion and the work that you do because not everyone has that focus. And thank goodness we have so many employees that are so hardworking, dedicated to their jobs because it's what make this this is what makes the county great is our people. So with that, I'll ask Commissioner Cofalos, do you have any comments or questions you'd like to ask Lori Lopez or Miss Carol Block, our two outstanding, amazing uh, folks responsible along with the team for this um, 40th anniversary honor. Uh, thank you. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Lori and Carol. Um, definitely um, 40 years is a, is a good track record. And I guess I'm not surprised. And it's, it's nice as an elected person or as elected officials, we can, you know, we have um, good relations and good trust in, in the work that's being done. Um, I, I would actually... You know, regarding what you just shared, the compare and contrast from 1982, I, I was around back then. Things have changed. I wonder if it's on a like a one page or it'd be interesting to have access to that information. I, I would welcome that. I believe we would welcome that. And also one consideration is whether or not what you just shared, um, it could be weaved into um, as part of the presentation when we are on board new employees uh, you know, maybe a, a discussion with HR human resources about whether or not this might be um, a way to update um, our trivia, uh, our trivia questionnaire. But but other than that, just thank you. Tremendous work. Once again, I'm I go back to the guiding principles, the six guiding principles, and here we are with one of the guiding principles having to do with um, our responsibility to be good fiscal stewards, uh, to manage the uh, public treasure properly with uh, the utmost accountability and transparency. So we're, we're following that guiding principle. And in a moment, we'll hear from our independent auditors more details about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori Lopez. Thank you, Carol Block. Thank you, Commissioner Gofalls. Commissioner Stevens. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Lori. Congratulations. Um, that's I'm still trying to get over the fact that 1982 was 40, 40 years ago, though. So that uh, that's like thrown me for a little loop here. Cause, um, but uh, um, and it's remarkable that you've been um, part of almost half of those years. And I thank you for your service to the county and, and for Carol as well. Uh, this is this is a remarkable achievement. It means that we're, we've done good work for 40 years. And so that's why it was you know, a real honor for to come into this organization, knowing that the transparency, you know, was really important. Um, you know, as we look over, as Commissioner Kafala says, as we as we look to take care of the public's money, you know, the money that we're entrusted by the public, 
uh, the transparency piece is, is crucial, right? We, we need folks to know that we're doing a good job with their money, that we respect the fact that they've worked hard for those dollars mm -hmm. and that they're investing in their local government um, to take care of business here. And so um, to do that for 40 years is, is a real honor and it's, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to celebrate with you because I, I, I really believe that this is crucial to the work that we do. Um, not only that we do good work, but that we show the work that we're doing um, and show how we're taking good stewards of the money. And so really appreciate your work. And, um, yeah, the, the st some of the statistics that you read off were, were pretty remarkable as well. It shows how much the county's grown and really honestly become a more vibrant um Place, right. I mean, I think we've done so much good work. I mean, to think about Horsetooth not even being part of our portfolio of open spaces. And now it's kind of one of the gems in, in our uh, open space areas. And so uh, just, you know, we've, we've come a long way. We have a long way to go, but uh, want to stop and celebrate the success with you. And, and thank you for your service in, in um, making this happen. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate it. Thank you um, again, Lori. I just wanted to um, kind of build off my colleagues' comments. In 1976, um, you talked about the Alon Lake, but I was here in the morning of 1976 visiting relatives right there near the because they lived now what is Thompson Valley Town Center in Loveland. They that was the field of horses across from HP, and I was here that morning, and it's a ear. Um, um, can't be erased from my mind kind of memory mm -hmm. as a child being 10 years old. And when you talked about HP in 19, I think I was here actually playing in 1982 against Thompson Valley High School tennis and the courts, the you know, at that high school across from, you know, HP and how much that has changed and, um, you know, the, the schools and just reputation of like, oh, wow, we're going to go and play against, you know, um, Thompson schools. They're so tough, you know, and, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's been a progression. And I, what kind of drove my question, my, one of my questions I have, because um, I'm presenting at the National Association of Counties and I'm highlighting we have this disaster fund that we have because we need to write checks right away. And it drew my attention about the 1982. Um, you said that, and I remember that Lawn Lake flood because I, I visited right after. I mean, I, I mean we've had a lot of uh, unfortunate natural disasters. And this one was a little different, but you, you said we had a fund there. How much was in that fund? I mean, if, and you don't have to give, if you, don't, if you have it now, that's great. But, and have we always had some kind of fund like that? I'm just curious. We have not always had it. Um, I'm not sure when it was dissolved, but we resurrected it um, recently. Um, but back in 1982, there, um, we brought in $219,000 in revenue, spent $156,000, and had a balance left over of $63,000. For that fund? For that fund. Wow. And do we know where that revenue came in? Did that just come from general fund? or? I, I don't know that. Yeah, though I'm just yeah. curious because because um, we do have that fund, and I don't know when we re resurrected it, but we just know it's not if but when. And so, um, and I know you all have helped keep us. It, it's a lot of accounting about all these different funds and where money goes. But I, I have to um, just appreciate your presentation, how you how you presented today, and having you both here. And I mean, I truly mean it. Uh, just. Carol and you included with this, the, the folks have worked here for so long and done such an exemplary job and provided this transparency and just exemplary, outstanding um, work to receive this for 40 years in a row is out just amazing. Thank you for bringing us this little coaster. It's going to be a great reminder. It is important for the public trust to have trust in their government and being transparent and, and having an independent firm verify that we are being good stewards of taxpayer money and being transparent about it is, is huge and something that um, I hope the public are listening in and understand how, how fortunate we are to have these amazing staff who do this work every day and provide these reports and don't go for the minimum, but go above and beyond. So um, I just want to say um, we don't get to see you very often, and so just grateful that you're here today, both of you, and we get to celebrate this with you, and just outstanding work, and um, yeah, still the, some of the same, same things, but still we've done a, you guys have done a lot of work over the years. So I will ask Lorenda now if you would like to add some comments. I know you knew probably this was coming for a while, and um, and you also worked, uh, worked closely with these folks throughout the year. So Lorenda. Yeah, I guess I'll just say that I really appreciate this award is about transparency and full disclosure. 
and that Larimer County has gotten this award that celebrates transparency and full disclosure for 40 years. I think that's the kind of thing that breeds trust in local government, um, and you being good stewards, your teams being good stewards, we have a top-notch accounting team. We have wonderful employees across the organization, but we really rely on your teams um, to help keep us um, kind of on the good side of transparency to make sure that we know when there are problems, that we, under, we celebrate when things are good, um, and that we are forecasting what's coming. So thank you for your work. Thank, please thank your team, Lori, Carol. I think you're great examples of what this award is all about. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, and, and please express our gratitude to your whole team, because as you, you said, there's a lot of folks that help put this all together. So um, we would like to take a photo. This is a big deal. Um, I hope you'll bring, I want to take a picture of that book. I find that fascinating. And, we'll, and for the public's knowledge and for Justine and those in the control room, we're just going to pause for a couple of minutes to take this photo op and celebrate this important uh, uh, 40th consecutive year of receiving this award. Thank you. I did want to point oh, out, yeah. we actually have a plaque and each year you get a medallion. And I said to Lori, well, you didn't bring the plaque? And she said, no, it's too heavy. It's After heavy. W winning this for 40 years, the plaque is too heavy. We can't even hang it on the wall because it'll tear the wall down. So, <laughs> Well, that's, 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 a, that's a good problem to have. Yes. Um, we'll have to maybe take a picture. We'd love to see it. So thank you. So we'll go ahead and take this photo with this. Po um, this is made. You guys can hold up your little 40 coasters. Thank you so much. Okay, I believe that we are now back on air, and I want to thank um, the, the team and Justine and the team for um, their patience as we've gone off on the air as we um, install this new system. Uh, we just got done celebrating um, the recognition of the 40th Government Finance Officer Certificate of Achievement Award, and really a big deal. And so we're going to follow up. This is very appropriate that we have now um, following it, the review of the auditor's results and acceptance of the 2022 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, or the ACFR, which is what I mentioned before. And so again, we'll have Carol Block and Lori here also with this presentation. And I'll let you take this away, Carol, because this, um, this is also really important for the public trust and for the public to know and for our transparency. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just do a brief introduction. Again, I'm Carol Block, and I am the director of the finance department. And one of the requirements of finance is that we produce annual financial statements and that we have those audited by a firm of independent public accountants. And this year's annual report was audited by the firm of Reuben Brown. And so I will have uh, these two gentlemen from Reuben Brown introduce themselves to the audience, and then they will go over their audit results for the board and um, also give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. So I'll turn that over. Thank you, Carol, and welcome. And and go ahead and, and proceed. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having us. I was uh, kind of enjoying the historical context on where the county has changed. I was looking back, since I'm a governmental accounting geek, that's, since that's what we do most of the time. Gasby's Statement 1 was issued in 1984, which was two years after that uh, original ACFR that we were talking about for the 40-year run on the GFA certificate. Most of those stayed in place through 2001 and were well over 100. So we've gone from GASB 34 in 2001 to well over 100 currently. So we're going to not only talk a little bit about the audit results, but also about some upcoming GASB standards. Why is that important? Your finance and accounting team is very busy, not only keeping up with growth in the county, but changes in how things need to be accounted for. And they do a great job of that every year. I'm Matt Marino. I've been your engagement partner the last several years. Joining me is Max Habercorn. He has been your engagement manager manager for the last several years as well. We're going to go through the audit results relating to your calendar year 2022 audit. Um, I'm going to spend most of the time in the viewpoints document, which was included in your, your uh, agenda packet. Uh, the viewpoints document is really our communication as auditors to you as those charged with governance. Um, you'll see a couple different things in there that we'll go through. I'll start on document page two. So on the left hand is kind of what we're required to communicate to you. And on the right hand of that page is what we're communicating to you. 
So because we are independent accountants and auditors, we, there are professional standards that we have to follow. We follow those. We follow uh, uh, generally accepted auditing standards, but also we have to follow governmental auditing standards because we not only perform a financial statement audit, we also for, perform a federal funds audit, which I'll let Max talk a lot more about. Um, we did issue an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements. I know unmodified sounds very unexciting, but that's the best we can give you. Um, that's auditor speak for Gold Star. Great job. You did everything you should have materially. And so that's that. We also issue a report on the internal control over financial reporting in compliance with governmental auditing standards, which Max will talk about the results of that here a little later. And then we also issue a audit over the federal funds audit where we look at the different programs, um, human services and various other programs and how that money is being spent. And Max will talk about that later in the presentation. If we go on to page three, I kind of touched on this a little earlier. Um, the the left-hand side talks about the uh, policies of the county and the right-hand side talks about some of the significant disclosures we'd like to highlight that are included in the financial statements. We did have to implement one new uh, Governmental Accounting Standards Board standard this year. Um, much like the private company standard regarding leases, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board also issued kind of a, uh, I was what I would call a sister standard, whereby if you took accounting back when I took it, there were operating leases and capital leases. All that goes away. Um, there's new accounting for leases. There's one way of accounting for it. It all goes on the books as some sort of liability. So the county did implement that this year. Um, they did that really with very minimal assistance from us, just some minor questions here and there, but they were ready to go from an audit perspective. It was not a small task, um, which is a great job on them. They'll get to do it again with regard to another standard this year, which Max will talk on, but really great job getting that standard done because it was uh, you know many years of accounting for leases one way, and then you have to change the way you account for it and, and get all that um, done. And if you think about how vast the operations of the county are, there's a lot of different agreements that could or could not qualify as a lease under the standard. And so they went through that analysis and did a great job of that. Um, note six about self-insurance is one I'd like to highlight just as an important disclosure to make sure you understand and read. Um, the note seven, which talks about the landfill post-closure costs that have been accumulating over time. That's one that's always there. Um, note 14 that talks about post-employment benefits of the county. And then note 16, um, the commitments and contingent liabilities with related to the county. All those standards or all those disclosures are things that I would expect to see in governmental financial statements, um, hence why the county has received its GFOA certificate for 40 years straight. The disclosures that we expect to be there are there and they are materially stated correctly. So that's important to know. Um, inherent in every set of financial statements, I'm on page four of the viewpoints document, are estimates. Estimates are necessary to prepare financial statements. And so there's a couple estimates I'd like to talk about. The first one is your estimate for the liability for the closure and post-closure liability of the landfill. It's an estimate. We don't know exactly how much it'll cost, but you hire um, engineers and experts to help quantify what that co closure cost will be. And then the management estimate of the leases and the lease liabilities and the assets, because there are some discount rates and some of that. As I mentioned earlier, your team was all over the leases standard. They had all their rationale for why estimates were made the way they were, what sort of uh, documentation they reviewed to make sure those estimates were reasonable, and we concurred that they were materially reasonable. And so, um, great job with that. On page five, I'm to talk about any corrected or uncorrected misstatements. Um, this is important because um, if you have a lot of corrected misstatements as a result of the audit process, it could be indicative that the information you're receiving on a regular basis may not be as accurate. Well, I'm happy to report we didn't have adjustments, so um, your information is likely accurate because we didn't have to correct it at year end during the audit process. So that's important to point out, and we had no uncorrected misstatements that were to point out for you. On page six, we're to let you know if there were anything else that uh, um, affected our retainment as your auditors, um, nothing to report. Your team is always great to work with. Carol and Lori and their entire finance team, as well as people outside of finance, treasurers. We touch a lot of different departments in the county. And so whether it be finance or other departments, everybody is very uh, helpful and very communicative with us. And we get the audit done on time so that we can file for the GFOA certificate and continue that 40-year streak. So happy to report that. 
Um, also, I'm happy to report on page seven that we did not issue any findings or uh, control deficiencies that we would classify as material weaknesses. Um, that's important just because if there are material weaknesses, we need to let you know. So your, your processes, your controls that are functioning at the county, there was nothing that we felt that we needed to report to you on that. And then on page eight, Max is going to talk about the federal funds audit. So I've spent a lot of time talking about the financial statement audit. But because the county receives and expends federal funds, you get to do a, an, another special audit, and I'll let Max talk about that. Hello. Um, yes, so that audit specifically is called, uh, or more formally recognized as, as a single audit, and it is required for any entity that spends more than $750,000 in federal funds in any given year. Um, and obviously, the county being so entwined with you know federal programs that's something that is a common occurrence. And as Matt also pointed out a little bit earlier, this is the ACFR is a document that we mostly are involved with finance, but the single audit is something where we don't involve just finance, but a lot of the other operations and the activities of the county. Um, a lot of the times it's going to be your Department of Human Services. Uh, as we, the people that we just saw earlier, the uh, Department of Health and Environment also have a significant uh, role to play with these federal funds. And um, they get, this is get done on a rotating basis. Not all programs are audited every single year. There's a calculation that we're required to do under the uniform guidance um, and the Office of Man Management and Budgets um, compliance supplement. Those are the guidelines by which we do the single audit and they tell us which programs to select. Some of that has to do with how risky the federal government believes the federal funds are as a certain federal programs. Some of it's just purely dollars. If you have a high value program, it means it's just something that they're more likely to want to see be audited. Um, specifically related to that, the programs that were selected this year, we have six in total. Um, two of them were um, higher risk because they were ARPA funding related, um, the American Rescue Plan Act. One of those is the state and local fiscal recovery funds, and then the, also the emergency rental assistance program. Uh, two other ones are, or the other remaining ones are just selected for their high dollar value and their importance to the county. The Title IV e foster care program, the Medicaid cluster, the emergency watershed protection program, and the supplemental food for women, infant, and children, better wise, are otherwise known as WIC. Um, those six programs in total cover about 66% of the total federal funds spent by the county during the last fiscal year. So that's a pretty good slice and coverage of the federal funds spent by the county just from those six programs. Um, as far as for us to report, uh, Matt said it, we have no modifications to any of our reports, a clean opinion across the board, um, and there were no control deficiencies or material noncompliance noted as part of that um, process. And then as far as the next couple of slides here, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about some financial reporting changes that are coming on. Um, there is always something cooking up at Gasby. There's something, there's changes almost every single year, and that's something that, as part of finance, you have to be able to adapt and think through new standards and implement those. And that's something that, you know, the finance team at Larimer County has always been really good at. Um, as Matt mentioned earlier, uh, statement number 96 is probably the next big one coming up next year. What it, that's supposed to do is take all of the agreements that you have for specific IT arrangements, think Microsoft Office, those kind of, uh, you know, any services that you purchase that are software based and are on a subscription longer than one year, those are now going to be recognized as liabilities, long term liabilities, and right to use assets, as we call them. So that's, it's a net effect of nothing on the balance sheet, but it is a visual representation of what the money is for and where it's going over the course of those agreements. Um, and then also a couple of other things that just minor clear, uh, uh, updates to certain other standards, SCASB Statement 97 related to certain component unit criteria. This does affect um, certain um, deferred compensation plans, but it just clarifies anything. It's not going to change anything from the financial statements for the county. Um, and then Statement number 99, basically that's just a standard that reconciles um, some, you know, guidance between FASB and GASB and um, it clarifies a few things. So nothing that will have a major impact unlike GASB 96. Uh, the last couple of things that are attached in the um, viewpoints document are the appendix. One is the signed management representation letter. That is a letter that um, the management of the county signed, basically attesting to us saying, hey, we didn't mislead you. None of the information we gave you was incorrect or uh, things along those lines. And then 
I think that's the only appendix we have, which, as Matt said, because we had no adjustments, we don't have any other appendices. So, so long story short, clean opinion across the board, both for your financial statement audit and your federal funds audit. Um, your team works very hard at that. Um, it's not no small task, and we really uh, love partnering with the county to get this audit done. Yes, we are independent, but we very much look at it as a team approach because it takes everybody doing their part to get it done. Thank you. And I want to thank you both for being here today and explaining it in such a way that for members of the public and all of us can kind of digest and understand. So I want to say a special thank you to that and, and really grateful for the partnership. I was looking kind of went to page five and kind of reading some of this of the larger, um, you know, just the financial report and, and appreciate, you know, this as well. So just wanted to um, thank you both for, you know, how you presented this. I'm going to do something a little different just real quick because um, I'm sure my colleagues might have questions, but this is such a um, important work, part of the work that we do. And and again, Lori and Carol are just outstanding and so grateful for their, their work and their team's work. But I'm going to start with Lorenda um, to have her make some comments before we ask questions, just because um, this is stuff that you as a county manager deal with on a daily basis. And I know you keep a really your fingers on the pulse of this at all times. And so I wanted to start with some of your comments today, because this is also reflective of your work along with the other team's work. And I want to commend you as well, because this is also reflective as your work as a county manager. I appreciate that, and I really want to deflect that back to the finance team because they are extraordinary. Um, it's great to hear that the cooperation is full as we would expect it to be. Um, I hear from colleagues that's not always the case, that sometimes they get notes that feel unfair. I think our team really um, is transparent. We try to be an open book. Whatever you need, you have. And that extends beyond the finance department. So it was also nice to hear, as you look at how the federal funds are spent, that you found good cooperation across the county, which is not surprising. It's exactly what we would expect. But it's great to be said out loud in a meeting like this that um, we do want to be transparent and be good stewards of those dollars. So again, thank you to the team, Carol, Lori, everyone who works in accounting, everyone who's part of this process, um, and to you all. It's um, it, This has gotten to be kind of a woohoo moment each year because we're we have good news because we have good folks doing good things tracking the county's funds thank you lorenda um commissioner stevens yeah um thank you uh, matt and max for your report um i guess clean opinion is in uh is in accounting speak like woohoo <laughs> it's an a plus um even though if the language isn't quite as exciting um and the unmodified, I guess you called it also an unmodified opinion, is that what? Correct. Yeah, yeah that's okay. the new language. It the used new to be language. called uh, unqualified or clean. They've changed it over. I okay. mean, I've been doing this over 20 years, so it's, right. it's changed a couple times. So Right. Uh, well, well, we appreciate having the unmodified opinion, and thank you very much for your work. Um, I have just a couple questions. So with regard, um, when you were talking about the landfill closure expenses, um, is that something that has to be... Uh, Re you know, those expenses have to be refigured every year, or is it, does it stand for a couple of years? Uh, just, just thinking about, e you know, EPA standards changing and different kinds of things that might change, is that something that we have to ask engineers to evaluate every year for? Engineers evaluate it regularly as part of the report that's issued, and so okay. if there were a major change in how you would need to address the closure costs that would be accounted for once the new engineer report gets issued and then it would get accrued over time um, okay so if it, we see changes then we would make those on the on correct. documents yeah. okay um and then with regard to the federal um funds audit which that sounds even more complicated because when we when federal fund <laughs> funding of some of these programs is explained to us we we're we're very thankful for the accountants in human services who um, figure out how to um, report and allocate those funds. Uh, but with regard to, like you said, six programs were selected and they made up 66% of the federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, do, do who selects which funds that are audited? We would based on risk. So there's a couple things okay. that could make something risky. It could be a brand new program. ARPA mm -hmm. is a great example. That did not exist prior to the pandemic. Sure. The rules re relating, especially not so much ARPA, but coronavirus relief, if you remember a couple of years ago, they were changing throughout the entire time. So that's what made them risky. And so the federal government issues something called the compliance supplement, which is like our audit guide saying, 
hey, here's how you should audit these programs. We deem these ones risky. Here's what cities, towns, counties, school districts need to be doing to administer those programs. And you as auditors need to audit against this these set of rules to make sure they're doing that. And so it's really based on dollar value. When was the last time it was audited and how hard the program is to operate and, and some to do with your staffing at the county is, has the department had a ton of change? Would that make it harder to run that program? That sort of stuff as well. So you, with, with the federal government guidance, determine what programs would be yeah. uh, most Correct. risky or, or have, or fit some of that criteria. Okay. Correct. So, and, and you said one of the criteria is um, how long it's been since it has been audited. Yeah. So, so you, Anticipate next year auditing different programs, I would assume. Some of them will get to be every year, um, especially okay. those, the, the, the coronavirus or pandemic-related fundings. There's a okay. list of, I think, it's, is it six programs currently that are still on the high-risk list that gotcha. will likely be audited until they're either gone. Um, but there's some that have stayed on for a while, like uh, Medicaid is one of those that's been on for a while. It's been deemed higher risk. But think of it. It's very detailed auditor speak, but the big sure. programs have to be audited once every three years, at basically. Least, yeah. at, at least once okay. every three years. Okay. Because they want, if you think about the federal budget, they want to make sure the big programs are getting spent correct. They do care about the smaller ones. That's why they get rotated in and out, but they really want to make sure the, the big, meaningful programs are getting audited. Is it, is, and sorry, I don't want to get into too much detail because I know we have other things. But um, with the emergency rental assistance program, the auditing of a program like that where a lot of the funds go kind of out the door, does that does that add to the complication or the risk that, that, that the, as the federal government sees it or as you see it? Yeah, yeah it's actually one of the components of uh, our risk assessment that we have to do is, you know, who's actually spending the money and what kind of control structure is being thought about it. So in the case where... In, you're talking about with ERAP, um, that a, a lot of that money is, and a lot of the compliance that we're testing to is not necessarily just the pure expenditures like we would in some other programs that you'd be running, but more along the lines of the, your monitoring of what we call a subrecipient, who is you know an entity who's taking the money and then running that program on the county's behalf. And so the compliance requirements that we're looking at is more of like, what are you doing to observe the people you're giving money to? Are you making sure that they're following the right compliance requirements? Because that's what you're doing. In the same way that the state's doing it for the county, because they you get a lot of funding from the state. The state's observing the counties and saying, okay, are you spending it the way we're intending you to be doing it? And you're doing the same thing and monitoring that same way. And that's kind of what we test when we have a program like that. It's not necessarily just the pure you giving the money. It's about more of a qualitative uh, aspect of it, the reporting between you and your subrecipient, um, you know, and those kind of activities. Did they, did, they get a, did they get a federal funds audit? Did their federal funds audit say, uh, you didn't do as good as we sure. thought you did? So tighten this up. So that's why, as Max mentioned, the state is very much interested in the county's single audit or federal funds audit because some of the programs are passed through from the state. And so they'll look at it and say, oh, Larimer County is doing a good job for the programs we've given them. And so just like that, um, with emergency rental assistance, the county will look and say, what did the entities we gave that money to? How did they do? Sure. So... Yeah, so that becomes pretty complicated. Well, thank you for explaining that. I appreciate it. I feel like I could ask a million other questions. I'll let my colleagues they ask said, some They questions. told me I couldn't do an eight-hour presentation. No, so I, I appreciate <laughs> that. But, I mean, it is it is important as we get additional different kinds of federal funds to really look at that. And and because as commissioners, we, you know, some of this is, you know, the WIC and that, that's that been programs that we've had for years. But, I mean, ERAP and the ARPA dollars are newer funding to our county, it's just really, you know, interesting, and it's money that we see more going out the door and have more kind of say in it versus a program like WIC, which is pretty standardized and stuff. So I'm glad to hear that, um, that well, there again, the clean or unmodified opinion um, stands for all of these programs and appreciate your work because it is very complicated and, and I know it involves a lot of relationships and especially when you're touching subrecipients and other, I mean, it, it, the complexity is, is pretty, pretty amazing. And so appreciate your help with this and, and thanks for the continued partnership. Thank you, Commissioner Stevens. Commissioner Kafalos. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you folks for your presentation. And as has been stated, um, 
I'm sure we're all grateful to receive, uh, to be issued an unmod unmodified clean report. I appreciate that you looked at our internal controls financial statement audit, and then certainly what was just discussed and questions asked regarding the federal funds audit. So I, I'm grateful for that. And it is once again, a testament to our finance department and our accounting division. A question that I have, uh, some of my questions were answered in the previous discourse, but regarding what I understood, uh, let's see, Max, uh, yeah, the financial report changes going forward. There was some reference to statement number 96, uh, software related things and, mm -hmm. and that how they would be viewed as long term liabilities. Could you explain what that really means in, in, do you want to do in practical want to do terms? And will that apply to, um, I mean, recently we just, uh, I think it was last year, or this early this year, we we changed our whole communication system. We call it UCAS, mm -hmm. Unified Communication as a Service. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically we're all operating under the Zoom platform. Uh, I, I assume these changes will apply to something like that. So, yes, so long as that agreement is longer in nature than um, 12 months or less. So if it's a long, it has to be a long-term agreement. If you're on a year-to-year -year basis, it wouldn't be something that you'd be considered because uh, you didn't enter into a long-term agreement. So what we're trying to capture, or what I guess Gatsby's trying to capture is, if you have a liability that lasts longer than a year, that liability is being put on the book. So you, it's not like you're you know, making any changes to what you do normally. It's just a physical representation on your um, financial statements of this liability that you have to pay out in the future. So that's all it's trying to represent. And it's just something that we already do for leases this year. Yeah. And it's just trying to reflect that for other agreements in specifically for these IT arrangements, which are frequently, more and more frequently being, you know, entered into as opposed to purchasing software like you used to, you know, used to be able to go out and buy a copy of, uh, you know, Microsoft Windows, but now it's not so you much a floppy disk of it like that those days you don't change. you don't have a license anymore that you have a you know agreement to re-up every single year to continue to use the service now and so that's what it's trying to show in the financial statements as opposed to you know purchasing physical software which you don't do as much anymore so uh, thank you max that's very helpful and the reference to floppy disks <laughs> I, I imagine that's what we used back in 1982 um, <laughs> does harken back to a previous probably, time probably even before floppy i don't know it's uh, i used i used a floppy when i was in college that's so. when they were actually floppy disks. yeah they were literally floppy so yeah, it really the statement really is there to take the accounting to where it needs to for how software companies are really engaging buyers of their their products it's really a change in the the software and the providers have changed how they they license it and they don't give you a license that's good until they quit supporting it it's we're going to have you pay on an annual basis we might store some of your data and do ancillary other things and therefore we need to change the accounting to take that into account um thank you commissioner and in 1984 and 82 i didn't even own a computer <laughs> and i remember when i finally got one to go off to college it was like three times as much as I pay now, and it just took up my entire desk. So um, those are the days, right? So <laughs> since we're reflecting back, but um, I have to um, just say again, thank you for being here today in the partnership and just having this um, unmodified and clean audit is just outstanding, especially when we had no amendments. That's just really, um, again, to our finance um, department team and director and and, and everyone else involved um, with our, our county manager, everyone, it's just, for the public's interest, this is really important to to highlight that um, Larimer County is, you know, doing a great job of being transparent and accountable. And and I like and say one again, my heartfelt deep gratitude to those folks in the team because without, you know, I can sleep at night. Maybe you're not sleeping at night, but I don't know how you can keep track of all these changes, especially during the pandemic with the changing conditions for American Rescue Plan dollars and the the um, Fiscal Recovery Act. And then also we've added, as I believe, the um, opiate abatement settlement, which now the county is the fiscal sponsor, which we have taken on. And those rules 
as Carol's been very um, hardworking and dedicated to, those rules have been changing as well. Um, and, and, the rent, and, you know, we did great work with all this money, and we've really tried to make sure it's for the public benefit. But also, I mean, you mentioned the rental, you know, emergency rental assistance. That was critical for keeping house. We also had the, the fire and the false floods um, that under the Department of Agriculture, the emergency water, sh um, water protection, um, debris removal, and bank stabilization, critical work that I see in here. Um, talking about the Department of Justice, Justice grants that you're tracking. It's a lot, it's a very complex and daunting um, to, they each have their own set of rules, I'm sure. Yes, and they do. Thank goodness for you and all the work that you do and our team do, and just to help make sure that um, we're being good stewards and that public can, this is, I hope the public's listening because this is really about the public trust. This is, you know, black and white um, showing that we're, we're being transparent and doing, being good stewards of this taxpayer money. So I, um, Thank you all for the presentation. And um, I really, um, as you were talking, I, I, I had a whole set of new eyes because I had flipped through this. And as you were talking, it was like, oh, wow, I'm glad you highlighted that, that drove my attention to that. So I want to thank you again for um, talking us through that. It was very, very helpful and um, just grateful um, to celebrate this woohoo team. Yay, this is great work. Um, so now we have to approve um, to that we accept this report, unless there's other questions or concerns. But I, I don't need to repeat. I, my colleagues asked the same questions I was going to ask, so I just, you know, no sense asking them again. Um, so with that, um, we need to now approve this. So I'll ask Commissioner Kofalos to make that motion, please. Yes, I'd be happy, more than happy to. I move. Let's see, I move to approve the 2022 annual comprehensive financial report. Thank you, Commissioner, for that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Well, um, well done. Congratulations, and thank you both for your work and your partnership. Thank you. Okay. Um, Cool stuff. And I believe this is this report and all these information is on our website. So you can access that for members of the public that are interested to that. We have an amazing website. Go to LarimerCounty.org.gov and um, check this all out. It's important work. So now um, I'll have invite Josh Fudge, our budget director, to come up because we have a couple of items um, that are related to this. But um, he's going to give us a report on the behavioral health services provided by the Alliance for Suicide Prevention of Larimer County as a part of our immediate needs program, which I believe came out of our American Rescue Plan dollars. But I'll let Josh explain that. And thank you for being here today, Josh. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Josh Fudge. I'm the county's director of performance, budget, and strategy. Um, somewhat of a segue from the last item through the American Rescue Plan Act, the county implemented an immediate needs grant program using those some of those funds to get uh, dollars and resources out in the community to help with the immediate impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one of those I think we all know were behavioral health issues that were really exacerbated by uh, the pandemic. And so uh, this is just the first of uh, presentations by many of our grantees to show the good work that they did with these funds. And so I am pleased to introduce representatives from the Alliance for Suicide Prevention of Larimer County. Uh, that being uh, Tracy Sandoval and um, Kim, Muller. Kim Muller. Sorry, I knew That's I was okay. gonna. I knew I was gonna do that. So uh, they will provide a presentation of the work that they did, and um, I'll let them take it away. Thank you both for being here today. It's so nice to see your faces. We've seen a lot of each other the last month or so. Maybe we sure have. Really grateful for our partnership. So I'll let you start with your presentation and go ahead and introduce yourselves again. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kim Muller. Um, I'm the program director at the Alliance for Suicide Prevention, and I brought Tracy Sandoval with me. Hi, I'm Tracy Sandoval, and I'm a youth program coordinator. So we're going to start out this morning and do a very brief high-level overview. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, we one of the well, the biggest program that we've used these funds for is our. Um, middle and high school programming, and we have hired two youth coordinators to do that work. Tracy is one of them, and she is our lead coordinator, so she's doing the majority of the, the teaching in the school, so I'm going to let her talk briefly about this program. 
Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. And so just before I get started, I do want to say this was Dawn and I's first year here. And a little bit of background about us. Um, Dawn was a corporate trainer with 911 Nationwide for like 20 years. And then my experience and background is in like education and neuroscience. So we come to this position with decades of experience. And um, one of the things I really like about the Reply program that's different than I think other suicide prevention programs in school is that we combine not only like signs and symptoms of suicide, but also like sources of strength. And so we're bringing like the positive and the things to pay attention to and how to talk to people together. And so I think that's really great. And I really love this program. And so, yeah, so let's talk about what we accomplished this year. Um, so we, we talked to 5,359 students in classrooms across Larimer County. Um, and that is, I think, a 20% increase from last year. Um, we also did 174 different presentations and we went to events and school clubs and community events all over Larimer County as well. And I want to say that like we're not just going into classrooms talking to students. We're also like doing outreach and trying to create a community of caring, basically, where we're all talking to each other and giving each other resources. And at the bottom, there's a number there that says 464 support requests. So at the end of our presentation, we ask, ask students if there's anybody they are worried about or if they're worried about themselves and they'd like to speak with a counselor. And those are 464 students that said, yes, we are worried about ourselves or we are worried about someone else and we'd like to speak to a counselor. So we were able to connect those students with somebody and I think that is really amazing. And so total, we talked to almost 8,000 community members about suicide prevention, about education, about resources. Um, and so that's a really great start to this first year of our job, I feel like. <laughs> And here's some data. Um, and so we do a pre and post survey. We ask the same eight questions um, before we present to students. And what we saw is, first of all, we saw some really great increases from last year's baseline data. Um, last year's baseline data was all in like 30% range. And we asked questions like, um, it's important to listen to someone when you're talking to them about suicide. Do you know about resources in your community? Um, do you know the importance about asking specifically about suicide when you're talking to a friend or family member? Um, and so some of those results, um, so up from like 30% baseline last the previous year, this year we started all in the 50s and 60%. And so that is like a 30% increase from, do you know where resources are? Do you know how to talk to your friends and family? Um, I think that's incredible right there. I'm not sure that it's all reply. I think COVID brought a lot of mental health awareness to the forefront, but still those are great numbers to look at. Um, and so then what we saw within our own pre and post training this year was about a 20% increase across the board. Some of the things we didn't really get statistically significant increases, like it's important to listen. Kids kind of knew that, so that was awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, some other things, um, a clear understanding about suicide signs and symptoms was an increase of, I want to say that was about 13%. Um, and then knowledge of how to help someone, that was also a that looks like a 9% increase, but we started off last year at 35%. Do you have um, the knowledge to help someone in a crisis? And this year we started at 81% as our baseline. So that is amazing. Um, and then are you familiar with resources in Larimer County? That rose from 68% to 90%. And I think that's one of the most important variables here is that do you know where to get help when you need it? And so that was a great thing. And that was 55% last year. So that was a nice increase as well. And then um, basically um, the overall um, evaluation of that is that our baseline numbers have increased as far as mental health in our schools go. And so that demonstrates like knowledge retention over time. And then we're looking to do a lot of more things. Um, we're working with school um, schools and administrations across all of Larimer County, trying to get us in every single classroom from fourth grade to 12th grade. Um, so we're moving forward and creating that. And then we're also working with organizations to, again, like I said, create that community of caring. And 
that's what we did this year. Thanks, Tracy. Amazing. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, amazing. Go ahead. Continue. In addition to working with youth, we know that youth, so according to the CDC, youth is zero to 24 years old. So we can't forget our older adults once they're out of the school system. So we offer training to um, our young adults, as well as those who are working with young adults. And so we did a lot of work with CSU and we did a survey last year as part of this work where we um, did, we surveyed over 600 young adults, uh, 18 to 24 years old and said, what do you need? What do you want? And so we're using this information in our upcoming year to continue to make targeted training for that. Um, in addition to this, we, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we're working with our LGBTQ plus community. And so that includes providing training to adults who serve LGBTQ youth. Um, and what that means is that we're providing training to it's, it's the ABCs of LGBTQ and how to be a trusted adult. Um, and that training has been really awesome and successful as well. And so if we could go to some more highlights. So one of the things that we've been doing for the for a few years now is we've been asking students when we do our presentations, what do you want adults to know about teen mental health? And we've collected over 10,000 responses. And from this, we use some of the funding to create this mural that you see on this wall. It's right up the street there. If you haven't visited it yet, please do. But on this mural, there's a QR code and you can scan it and you can listen to students' responses of what they want adults to know about teen mental health. I will say for everybody, the number one thing that they have to say is please listen and stop giving us advice. <laughs> All right. And then um, peripherally, that's a word. Yep. Um, in addition to all of this work, one of the awesome unintended consequences with the, of this was giving out gun safes and gun locks. So we do this for free to the community. Um, no questions asked. And because of the work that we're doing and we're promoting this, people have continued to come to us. So we give out I don't know how many gun safes every single month, but it's it's significant. And we know that, that how people die is just important as why people die. So thank you. And here's our contact information in case you need it. We welcome any questions at this time. Um, first off, let me just thank you for the work that you do in the community. And thank you for supporting me during May Mental Health Month as you guys came out and, and did some Narcan training and QPR training. Really important work. And uh um, just outstanding presentation. Um, so with that, um, I, I will turn it over to Commissioner Gafalis to see if he has comments or questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to express gratitude for the work you're doing in the community and appreciate that you had a table or a, event, you were a, a booth at the, uh, the Saturday's Pride Festival. I think that's really important. I did have questions related to your outreach to LG, LGBTQ+, but I think you've answered that. So, again, just to say thank you. Uh, I do walk by the mural. Uh, I need to get up close and see how it's interactive. Did you say that it actually, that there's recordings, or how is it yeah, interactive? Yeah, so it's an interactive mural. So there's a QR code that you scan, and then when you hold it to the wall, you can see the different comments that students have written. So it's a pretty cool, fun and, little. And one has to know how to use a QR code. You do. I... You just open up your camera and hold it. And it'll say, click this link, and it'll show you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Oh, Commissioner, it's a uh, it's really a cool thing. I hope you do it. It's kind of a, we're there for the kickoff, and um, it blew, blew my mind. It was just amazing. And then also, it, I, I, maybe you mentioned it was English and Spanish on both sides of the yes. mural, and I just really appreciate that element as well. Commissioner Stevens. Yeah, I just want to echo my thanks. Um, you know, we try we tried to get these immediate need grants from the American Rescue Plan dollars out to the community members, and so it's really nice to get a report back to see the work that you're doing. So I'm very appreciative. Obviously, this is a big concern in our community. It's a, you know, it's it's reached tragic proportions, and we know that folks, that young women especially, are are struggling with a lot of suicide ideation, and so um, I, I just grateful for the work that you're doing in the schools and you know, to protect young people and to, to educate them. And the statistics that you showed were remarkable, the improvements, that people really know how to get the resources. And that is so reassuring as I think about that, that we not only they know how to get them, but we have those resources in our community and they, they can access those. So, and then to have the 450 plus students that actually reach out after they see the presentation and realize, hey, something might be wrong with either me or one of my friends, 
I mean, that's that, you know, that's an immediate effect that you're having in our schools. So thank you very much. Just the only question I have is how long does some, does like the training take when you go into a school or is that like a half day kind of thing? No, it, it's no? like an hour and a half. Oh, okay. It's pretty quick. And, um, yeah. And so we're hoping to get into, we also just developed a elementary program that we are piloting right now. And we are hoping to get into all the classrooms from fourth grade to 12th grade across Larimer County with our suicide prevention. Well, that's remarkable. Thank you. You know, I just think that this generation of young people um, is so empathetic and so sort of in touch with not only how they're feeling, but with how their fellow students are feeling. And I just, that reassures me of their, you know, of their future to be able to change the world and, and also just to be able to take care of one another. So I think that um, that you're helping build that resiliency in that community amongst these young folks. And that's just, you know, that has to feel rewarding to you, but it's remarkable work. And so what a great use of our ARPA dollars. And thank you again for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, first, I just want to pause and, um, you know, this is part of the immediate needs grants. And we, you know, we designate and pull that aside to kind of get the money out for them from the American Rescue Plan dollars. We really wanted to be intentional with having transformational projects. But we also know there was immediate needs that we needed to address in the community and fantastic outstanding partners as yourself. We're doing great work and we needed to kind of help support you through a very, um, unpre I know we keep saying to everyone's like so tired of hearing unprecedented, but guess what it was and it continues to be. And um, you guys stayed um, stalwart and focused and diligent. So I want to just pause real quick and thank Laura Walker and Josh Fudge and their team who took in, um, this idea and immediately stood up and reviewed all these grants. We had dozens and dozens of grants and um, outstanding, worthy, um, great community partners doing work that we were all, you know, I'm still trying to find my magic wand. You get some, you get some, but we had to have a process. And and Josh Fudge and Laura Walker quickly um, figured out this program, read all the grants, and got and helped us, you know, get through that process and got the money out the door um, in a way that we could be accountable and have m uh, metrics and show that this money went and did, you know, we, we were not just throwing money, but we wanted to make an impact mm -hmm. and what an impact you have made. So first I want to just c commend Laura Walker and Josh, because this is your work. And now to see how th the, the information and the results and the metrics that we have to show this was I knew it would be, but we have things to show our public and be transparent that your money, it made a difference, especially for our youth that were, you know, impacted um, during the pandemic. Just as our older adults were isolated, these folks were isolated too. And we have marginalized folks and youth within those that community who were, it was targeted to them and helped them feel that they were listened to and valued. Um, Outstanding, you know, thinking about 90% in yeah. that retention, I don't know if that happens very often. You know, we're always talking about can we share what the county does and what a great, all the things we do and people remember because I still have, you know, trying to, people are amazed that property tax bills are not all going to the county still <laughs> and trying to say it's only 23% and some places only 15 and it's, um, that's an outstanding number. And so um, I, that is having probably long lasting impacts that we probably can't even imagine. Um, as someone who lost a family member to, to suicide and a friend, um, just thank you. Um, my nephew is younger, and so I know how important this work is, and the gun safety locks and, and your partnership in so many areas with so many partners it is valued, it's invaluable, and you guys, the work that you do matters, and I wanna thank you for that. And again, I wanna thank, special personal thank you for supporting me as I was trying to just train one more person with Narcan and QPR. And as you know, one of those classes with first on scene, but literally two weeks later, a youth saved a life. And so even if we trained one more person, um, it makes a difference. And you trained an older gentleman who was feeling pretty hopeless, trying to save lives in his 80s. And you guys treated him with care and compassion and helped him feel like he had more resources. And I wanted to thank you for that. Um, the mural is amazing. I know it was a project with the uh, Fort Collins mural project. Um, but I think you guys focused on the mission of letting youth voices amplify. 
um, they are living in such a time. I was thinking back, about, I was talking that with my kids. They're, they're now having playlists with some of the music I grew up with in college and high school. But we were talking about how things are so different. I'm like, you're listening to a song I listened to at your age. That's just bizarre, right? But they didn't. we didn't have cell phones. They didn't have this immediate, constant um, voices trying to invade their personal space. And um, it was supposed to be a tool for good, but there's some really dark places that I'm that you guys are probably aware of. And I, I, I just, um, I don't know if we will ever be able to measure the impact that you've had with this fund. Money well spent, obviously, I wouldn't say spent, money well invested yes. into our community. And, um, and I want to thank our federal partners, you know, the, our, sen our senators and congressmen who fought really hard and we had that money and, and thanks to all of our community teams and, you know, Josh and Laura, I mean, this program, I'm really glad that we're going back and revisiting this so the public understands um, where their money went and how it's made an impact. And I'm sure we're not done. Um, I just want to um, just appreciate the, what you've brought and shared on all that data. I think we got the slides. If not, we'd love yeah. to get the slide. Okay. Josh, and um, just, um, they're probably here. It's just, when you guys tell the story, it makes, it's kind of like seeing it again and just in a different lens. So I, I, um, we have some work to do, and, and as the Behavioral Health Center is opening up, I know our partnership will continue to, to grow and strengthen, and I just wanted to thank my heartfelt gratitude for the work that you do, because our county is making a difference, and our, our suicidal numbers are holding or going down, and that's because of the every single one of you who works this tirelessly, and I know we all have our stories, but you guys um, are really out there in the trenches making a difference, so thank you. So, Lorenda, I don't know what else you'd like to add. Um, this I'll, is one of those things that really touches my heart, so. I'll just say thank you for being here. The Alliance for Suicide Prevention of Larimer County is a great example of the immediate need grants that were made, and so it's important to highlight this good work that you did throughout the pandemic and continue and your metrics are incredibly impressive. Thank you for your hard work for our youth in the community. Thank you. Please, thank you. Well, thank you all for w waiting out. I hope you've learned something oh, yeah. more about the county it's today. It was really interesting, actually. Yeah, I wasn't it cool? It. <laughs> yeah, so now you can go out and tell everybody, compare us. I'm it's, so it's, proud of our county. Yeah, 1982. So cool. Well, thank you, thank you all. Yeah. I, I know we'll see you get each other again soon. Thank you for being here today. Okay, um, and I believe, Josh, you put these all on the website under our American Rescue Plan, or and we highlight this. So for members of the public, um, if you want to go learn more, there's lots of information there, and I can't thank you enough all for being here today. Um, I don't know. Could we just take a quick photo with them just because they came here? I know I, my colleagues, but let's do that because this is life-saving work, and I think it deserves a moment to recognize. Thank you. We'll pause, Justine, just for a moment. We'll make this really quick. Go ahead and put us back on the air. I'm hoping you can hear us. Go ahead. Okay. 
So I'll give it 10 seconds and then we'll start talking. Okay, so um, we are now moving on to item number five. Thank you for pausing. We really wanted to celebrate our partners at the Alliance for Suicide Prevention of Larimer County and their very outstanding and successful work um, as part of our immediate needs grant program. So now we have some really important work as we look and um, have a discussion on the Intergovernmental Agreement Designated Larimer County Housing Authority um, to Housing Catalyst. And I'll welcome Alia Rodriguez, who is our housing um, housing stability, but I think HEH housing, is it HEH drug? I thought you were housing, our housing. Housing um, stability program. Yeah, manager. program manager. So it says HEH, but so I'm, uh, Oh, health. Okay. So I um, just wanted to welcome you and thank you for your work. It's great to see you. Um, I know you're working tireless behind the scenes. This is a really important need in our community. So um, Aaliyah, what, um, can you tell us about this, is this IGA? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, as said, my name is Aaliyah Rodriguez and I'm the Housing yeah. Stability Program Manager. Um, I'm here to present the updated intergovernmental agreement between Larimer County Housing Authority and Housing Catalyst. Um, I'd like to start off just by talking a little bit about how we came to today, because there was a lot of history that brought me to this podium. <laughs> um, the Larimer County Housing Authority was established in 1981 when the Board of County Commissioners declared a need for a housing authority to serve unincorporated Larimer County. In the years that followed Larimer County Housing Authority, the programs solely consisted of the Section 8 certificate, rental certificate program. <clears throat> and in March of 1995, the Board of County Commissioners declared that they did not intend to expand that programming, and they also did not intend to develop affordable housing under the Larimer County Housing Authority name. So in December of 95 is when they entered into an intergovernmental agreement with Fort Collins Housing Authority, which is now known as Housing Catalyst. This intergovernmental agreement delegated all powers, functions, duties, and responsibilities of the Larimer County Housing Authority to Housing Catalyst. This intergovernmental agreement has not been updated since 1995, which was 28 years ago. So that's that's why we're here. And so why, why did we start looking at it now? When Larimer County established its most recent strategic plan from 2019 to 2023, um, goal two, objective four of that county strategic plan was to create a plan to redefine the county's role in creating targeted activities to address the growing need for affordable housing in Larimer County and also to expand housing assistance into the unincorporated areas. It was through this objective that the, t the objective lead team convened community housing partners uh, to identify gaps and also funded a housing needs assessment, which was published in 2021. One of the priorities that rose to the top from this community engagement and that housing needs assessment uh, was to evaluate and update this agreement that's before you. We heard from the Board of County Commissioners that the agreement needed to require outreach to our unincorporated areas. It needed to have clearer expectations of communication between the Housing Authority operations and their plans for the future with the Board of County Commissioners. And then it also needed to have some term limits on it. The term limits are there to encourage evaluation of progress towards goals throughout the years, and it's also there to give Larimer Co County the option to not renew if community needs deemed it necessary at that time. So the contract before you hits all of those key elements. It has a, an option to renew every five years. It requires clear communication reporting to the Board of County Commissioners, and it encourages outreach to unincorporated Larimer County. There's currently a work session scheduled for August 7th at 10 a.m. in which Housing Catalyst will be presenting 
um, about these topics. They will be reporting not only what they do for City of Fort Collins, but they will also be reporting what they do as Larimer County Housing Authority for the unincorporated areas of Larimer County, what outreach they're doing, what those vouchers are, uh, what they've been doing with those vouchers. Um, and we've also invited the other two housing authorities to this appointment as well. So you will also be able to hear from Loveland Housing Authority and Estes Park Housing Authority. Uh, so, the, so the board can really get a regional view of what our housing authorities are doing across the community and how they work together and separately for the specific communities that they serve. The intention is to hold this <clears throat> session annually so that Housing Catalyst can continue to report to you and so the other housing authorities can be invited to share the work that they're doing as well. This updated uh, agreement is just one piece uh, to the county's objective to redefining its role in addressing the growing need for affordable housing in Larimer County, but it's a big step and I'm happy to present it and be here. So thank you. Um, thank you, Aaliyah. Outstanding presentation and just so grateful um, that we have you here working with Larimer County. Um, um, just you have done outstanding work and just appreciate um, how you presented this item today. I just wanted to just pause there because um, I just thought that was amazing. So thank you. Um, let's start with any questions or comments. Um, and I believe I'll start with Commissioner Stevens this time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aaliyah. Thanks for bringing this forward. And it is something that we wanted to look at. I think there wasn't a great understanding necessarily of what that IGA contained or what the relationship was. We just knew that they served sort of as the uh, um, our housing board, but we didn't have a lot of connections with them. So I think that this really deepens the relationship and the trust between the two entities. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I, I, sorry, I had to step out for a minute, but I didn't know if you explained. So we'll, um, we'll, they'll be reporting back to us. Will we have sort of a seat there or a, be able to have a window in sort of what they're doing uh, on more than an annual basis? I know that Commissioner Kafalis was maybe going to do some of that work, and I don't, I don't know if there's an update on that piece. Because I didn't see anything really necessarily spelled out in the IGA, but it might be more of an informal agreement. Sure. Uh, so the IGA talks about that reporting back to you all about the work that they're doing, and it's through that work session, the first of which is happening in August, like I said, which will provide space for the commissioners to give feedback and ask questions about operations. Um, they've also opened the door to allowing commissioners to join committees from their board. Um, originally, we had talked about having a county commissioner on their board, but Housing Catalyst actually doesn't have that authority, so it could not be included in this IGA. If that's a path we'd like to go, we can continue to pursue, but it would have to be an agreement with the city of Fort Collins because they appoint the board. Yeah, thank you for reminding me about that relationship, their relationship with the city. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that, you know, serving on the committees is certainly will give us a window into the work. And then I think if we want to pursue that, you know, if they see that we're serious in doing the, the committee work and, you know, that that may be something we revisit with the city at this point. But just having a better relationship and an sort of an open door policy, I think, is a really important piece of this IGA. And so I thank you for your work on that. I think, like I said, I don't think that we didn't have a good relationship, but it really clarifies it and expands it a little bit so that we feel a little more comfortable um, with the role that they play as, as being our housing authority. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stevens. Commissioner Kofalas. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Aaliyah, thanks for your presentation and I think it's very helpful that you provided some of the history and the context going back to 1981 we seem to be having a lot of retro discussions uh, this morning um, I, a couple of comments regarding what uh, Commissioner Stevens said about the um, relationship so currently uh, I'm, I'm serving as a sort of a commissioner liaison to the um, the board meetings, which occur on Thursday mornings, I intend to be at the next one. Scheduling has been a little bit challenging. Serving on the various committees is not really a good idea because, for one, I think their finance committee 
meets when we typically have land use hearings. But I think there's value in a commissioner attending their um, their board meetings, which I, which typically occur, occur monthly on Thursday mornings. Um, I understood, you know, in terms of whether or not a commissioner could be appointed to the Housing Catalyst Board, that they were going to check with city council and the city manager to see if that is something they wanted to do. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's any update on that. That's what I understood. I know we don't have the authority that city council would have to approve something. Can you speak to that, Aliyah, if there's any update there or if we think we should continue to inquire? I, I can certainly do that on Thursday morning. Any thoughts there, Aliyah? Sure. Yes. So my most recent conversation with Julie Bruin regarding that was that any commissioner is welcome to apply for the open positions that come available um, for the Housing Catalyst Board, but they are unable to set aside a seat. And if we wanted that <clears throat> contractually bound that, that the county commissioners get a seat on the board, we would have to create that contract with the city. And so we can pursue that separate from this IGA. And if that's the guidance, if you'd like me to start working on that, I can contact the city and get that moving to see if it's a possibility. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, maybe one next step might be to have the conversation at the, the next uh, board meeting and kind of get a, a sense of where they're at with um, uh, whether or not a, a county commissioner should actually be appointed to the board or, or apply for a vacancy. Do you know if there are any vacancies or do they foresee any vacancies coming up? I believe she said she had a vacancy in this coming new year. Okay. Maybe we could talk about that offline. Definitely. Thank you, yes. Aaliyah. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I look forward to that con conversation as a Board of County Commissioners, too, about, you know, how, we're, how we interface with the City of Fort Collins. Um, Leah, I, th I really appreciate, again, you know, my colleagues mentioned this, we've had a lot of retro conversations, but when you think about um, – having a governmental agreement that's been there since 1995 that hasn't been updated or maybe needed to have some some revisions because times are different and conditions are different. And um, I think it's really good to be clear, to be kind, and make sure the agreement matches what we're doing currently because um, mm -hmm. things have definitely changed, as we've heard this morning, since 1980s, 1990s. Um, and certainly um, I think there's always been a need for a bar housing, but it, maybe not as um, – you know, currently what we're experiencing is this is a crisis across our whole region, the state, and the country. So um, I really appreciate the relationships you've been building and to for us to have more of a uh, interface or relationship building or an, an eye into what um, is happening. We, we've always had, a, you know, a good relationship, but I think we've tried to deepen that and to understand so we know where we can support. And I want to just thank you for inviting all the other housing authorities to come to that work session. I think that's going to be really interesting and, and powerful to, to, um, to, to listen because I think um, this work, you can't work in silos. It has to be partnerships. And um, maybe we can't um, be on their boards, but we can also see how we can support in lots of different ways and, and make sure that we're kind of aligned and not at cross paths when we're trying to do the same thing is just, you know, help folks have safe and affordable housing and attainable housing. So I, I think, um, you know, this is a, a conversation that we had and we wanted to have um, a little more of that, you said, feedback or, or especially in the unincorporated areas, which is for me very important as someone who lives in unincorporated Lamar County. Um, and it's um, important for those folks because we need that workforce and we need those folks to be able to live in those rural areas. Um, and it's very hard to find housing in some of those areas. It's actually probably even more complex than in our municipalities. So um, I'm really glad that we have that as a focus. And just I wanted to again commend you for your outstanding work. Um, you, you have made a tremendous impact since you first joined Larimer County. And I want to thank Laura Walker too for her for, um, leadership and supporting you and helping us kind of um, guide as you've been in helping with this, you know, housing stability area that we've been trying to focus on, and, and housing needs and assessments are really important. We now know where the where kind of where our we know where their problems are, but we actually have some data and information, and and uh, and just really appreciate this agreement. So, um, just my profound gratitude. 
please express to Housing Catalyst and that team and all those folks you um, work with my profound gratitude for our, this partnership and the work that they do. And I appreciate their willingness to to kind of update this and um, have this agreement kind of match kind of the um, conditions that we are in currently. So I will turn it over to Lorenda. I'm sure you have some comments and, or things you'd like to say to Ilian about this important IGA. I'll keep it brief. It occurred to me that this, if this contract were a person, it would be able to vote this December. And so that's how old um, it, it is and how important it was to update the agreement, to modernize it, to create that connectivity, because we know that all residents of municipalities in Larimer County are still Larimer County residents. And so it should feel more seamless as you go to, to get housing supports and other kind of support. So, Aaliyah, thanks for modernizing it. Thanks for taking this on. You sort of invented this role um, in the pandemic and post-pandemic, you've done great work, um, and I know you'll continue to create those um, relationships and nurture them. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenda. Thank you, Lorenda. Um, again, we're having a morning where we're all getting to realize how much time has flown by. Um, so I will ask Commissioner Stevens to make the motion so we can approve this intergovernmental agreement appointment. Yes, Madam Chair, I move to approve the Intergovernmental Agreement Appointment of Larimer County Housing Authority Board Commissioners and Assignment of Larimer County Housing Authority Powers and Duties to Housing Catalyst. Thank you, Commissioner Stevens, for that motion. Any further discussion, colleagues? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, three zero. Thank you so much, Aaliyah, for being here today, and thanks for hanging out as we went, did a, memory, a walk down memory lane. And we have one more item on our discussion. Great work. Um, and I'll sign that agreement here in a little bit, and you can have that. Um, we will now move on to our sixth and final item on our consent agenda before we have kind of our commissioner and county manager updates, is we have a grant agreement regarding the American Rescue Plan Collaborative Projects Grant Subaward for the Ketchner Affordable Townhome Purchase by Elevation Community Land Trust. And um, Lorinda, I think you have something you wanted to kind of alert us to real quick this morning. I do. Um, thank you, commissioners. So this grant agreement is listed incorrectly as a dollar amount in your packet. Um, it's listed as a county contribution toward this project of 1.5 million. That should be 1 million. And so as we talk about this, um, we have two options. We can continue on with that correction since it is lower than the amount that was published, or you can table this to next week where we'll have the correct agreement in your basket. It is entirely up to you. Um. Well, since we have folks from that organization here, I think it'd be great to go ahead and prove it. But I'll turn it, ask my colleagues, are you, since it is lowering the amount that's um, written, colleagues, are you okay with continuing forward with lowering the amount for the discussion since we have those, I um, want to respect our partners' time today. Any objections to that, Commissioner Stevens? I have no objections, and we've stated it publicly that the difference is there's no surprise from the recipients that they're not there. Right. Not getting um, an additional five, or not getting an additional five hundred thousand dollars. So, um, I think that I, I'm fine approving it today. Commissioner Kafals, any objections or concerns? Okay, great. Thank you, sir. So, um, again, I think um, let's see who's coming up to talk about this one. It's Is Aaliyah. it Aaliyah again? Aaliyah, you shouldn't have sat down. Now you go and get your steps in today. So, um, yeah, this is a really another exciting project, and thank you for you and Laura for bringing this forward to our attention. So I'll let you present on this and then invite, um, I'm sure you'll introduce, invite our, our wonderful partner. Thanks for being here all morning, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioners. Again, I'm Malia Rodriguez, the Housing Stability Program Manager, <clears throat> and I'm here to talk about uh, contribution to Kector Townhomes. Um, as a reminder, Larimer County received the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, funds, um, just over about $69 million from the U.S. Treasury. Um, as was talked about earlier, about $3 million of those dollars was put out immediately in those immediate needs grants, which we heard a presentation from. The rest of those dollars were set aside for transformational long-term projects to make a long-term impact on our community. Uh, Larimer County partnered with Bohemian Foundation uh, to engage the community and identify system gaps um, to, to use those dollars towards. Um, today we're discussing one of those long-term transformational projects for the ARPA contribution. Um, we'd like to contribute $1 million towards the Kector townhomes. 
Um, this project was first presented to the board in January of 2023. And then on February 15th of 2023, during a public work session, the board unanimously approved supporting the project. Uh, it's in alignment with community gaps that were identified in our 2021 housing needs assessment, specifically that we need more affordable homeownership op opportunities in our community. We need homeownership opportunities at or around $300,000, which is exactly where these townhomes fit in. Um, Kector Townhome Project creates 54 for sale townhomes in South Fort Collins that will be restricted to, pur to be purchased by community members who have a household income at or below 80% of the median income, um, which puts that sale price right at that goal of at or around the $300,000. Um, now I'm going to introduce um, Stefka Fanchi. She's the president and CEO of Elevation Community Land Trust, and she's going to speak a little more to the project and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, welcome. And is it Stepka? Stepka. Stepka. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, commissioners, for having me here. Um, Commissioner Falls, you may remember me from my Habitat days. It's good to see you. Um, but I have been uh, with Habitat. With you see, got, got me confused already, with Elevation Community Land Trust um, since its launch at the end of 2018. Um, so we are a relatively new community land trust. And for those of you that may not be familiar with that model, it is essentially a model of shared appreciation home ownership, where we as a as um, a nonprofit hold the underlying land in trust so that it can only ever be used for affordable home ownership. And we sell the improvement to qualified buyers who can then um, you know, ha realize that much lower um, price point. And uh, when they go to sell their home, they have to sell to someone else and they pass that uh, opportunity on to another household at the same AMI level. So the Kector Townhomes is a really great project, such a great example of a public-private partnership. We have 54 townhomes under construction in an absolutely gorgeous part of Fort Collins, right in between two elementary schools and two amazing parks. It's just such a gorgeous community. Every time I go up there, I look around and, you know, anybody would be so lucky to live here and see the mountains and, um, and have all of these amenities around them. So 54 townhomes that are, um, five of them will be two bedrooms. The remainder are three bedroom townhomes. So we are really looking to serve families in Larimer County. Um, they are priced or will be priced um, to be affordable to folks at 70% of the area median income with a maximum of 80%. And the reason that we price a bit lower is twofold. First, we want to make sure that we can serve a larger window of folks. So everyone from 60% AMI to 80% AMI with the right down payment assistance will be able to afford these homes. Um, and our partners at Impact Development Fund will be uh, working with us on that down payment assistance. Um, <clears throat> of those homes, um, they, well, they all have one car garages. They are um, beautifully designed and constructed. They have um, three bedrooms and two baths or two bedrooms and two baths. Um, and are, uh, have some, some yard space and, and are just a great place for families. So we're excited about them. Um, they're being constructed by TWG Construction. And the way that we are working in this particular uh, project is that the city of Fort Collins had this land in their land bank. They put out an RFP specifically for affordable home ownership. TWG um, wanted to do the construction and our role is really to come in very early in the project um, to say we will buy all of these units. And what that was able to do is to, to get um, more beneficial financing and things like that for the project, which will lower the cost over time because none of those homes are built on spec. They're all pre-sold, right? And so that allows the developer to do what they're uh, good at and for us to do what we are good at, working to fill the gap through fundraising between um, what we're paying and what we know that we need to sell those homes for. Um, that gap has grown because of the time in which we're, we're 
building, right? So um, the cost of construction has gone up, but more critically, the interest rate has gone up. And so our price has to factor in that interest rate so that we know that no one is going to be spending more than a third of their income on that um, on their housing payment. And that's their total housing payment, including taxes, insurance, the HOA, et cetera. And so um, as interest rates go up, our prices have to go down. Um, that's been a challenge in a couple ways. One, it's created this gap, which this grant would fill, which is really an, an amazing piece. Um, it also challenges us a bit in our community outreach, right? As folks hear, this is a terrible time to buy without realizing that through this program, they actually will have a lower price point and the same housing burden. And then after time, they could refinance and actually have a lower housing cost. So um, it's really actually a great time to buy. And so um, we're looking forward to partnering with the county um, and others to get the word out to folks on that. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, what a great project and appreciate you sharing um, all the background and kind of explaining, especially for members of the public listening and are in the audience today. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues might have some co comments or questions, so I'll turn this over to Commissioner Kofalis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steph. Great. Nice to see you again. And I appreciate um, the Land Trust's involvement in this project. I think we've asked this question before. I can't remember the answer. I, I know this is on Kector, Kector Drive or whatever that street is. Uh, what's the access to public transit for this project? Is there any? So I, I think that that's probably the, uh, there is a bus line on, uh, on Kector and it's like Kector and Half Moon. So it's very close to uh, 25. So it's really great for access to the highway, but there's maybe not the that level of um, public transport that is available. And, and did you say, what, what's the price range of these townhomes again? And uh, yeah, what's the price range? Yeah. So our initial estimates um, were that we would end up right below $300,000. It is actually, I mean, that would be for the three bedroom well, and less for the two. Um, it, we, because of interest rate fluctuations, that actual price point is going to have to be based on actuals at the time. So when these project or when these homes start delivering in late September, um, which is when they're gonna the first building will be done, that's when we'll price them so that we can ensure that the price is inclusive of all of those costs. So late September does mm -hmm. that mean construction? Has, is when, well when is, constru is, is all the funding in place, and when will the construction occur? And the uh, construction is well underway. Oh, um, this is sort of the last piece of the funding, and that funding is really what's going to enable our acquisition of those units. So, you know, often when you look at federal funding, it you either have to bring it in, uh, you know prior to actually breaking ground, but because we're using it for acquisition and not construction, um, we actually don't need it until that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, will there be some kind of uh, public event to acknowledge this important project? There will, yes, for and sure. I... We had a, a public event at groundbreaking and we will certainly have another one at completion. Presumably you'll inform us. Absolutely. Thank we you. We'd love to have you there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Commissioner Kafalas. Commissioner Stevens. Yeah. Um, thank you, Stefka. Thanks for bringing this forward. Just a couple questions. Um, so with the price maybe in flux still of the, the final price, will Impact Development Fund provide a higher um, down payment assistance to make sure that the, pay, their, the folks' payment will only be in that 30% range? Or how does that work? So most likely, so first of all, IDF has a, you know, a, a pool of funds that is, I think it goes up to $25,000 per unit, which is fairly generous for down payment assistance. Um, but really it is the actual price point that will fluctuate and therefore it is possible they'll need less down payment assistance because our price point would more likely go down, right? Because interest rates are higher. So unless... So, so it's it's not like we are suddenly going to go up in price. It's more likely that it would go down a little bit. Um, and to, so, to uh, 
account for those high interest rates? Is exactly. that what you're saying? Okay. Yes. And All so right. any impact development fund or other down payment assistance dollars would help us to reach deeper AMIs. So. Gotcha. And then mm -hmm. um, can you just explain just a little bit about how it works with building equity? So, so how, when, when a person sells that they're, they're clearly selling the house, not the land. And so how does that stay affordable, but the folks that are in there can build equity? What does yes. that look like? Thank you very mm -hmm. much for that question. So as you know, home ownership is pretty much out of reach for most folks today um, as there becomes this bigger and bigger gap. And so what a community land trust does is really f creates a bridge um, into market rate home ownership, right? So um, as someone is purchasing that home, they enter into a 99 year land lease with us. And every time it's resold, there's a new 99 year land lease put into place. And so that's why we call it permanently affordable. Um, and so uh, one of the main things that that land lease does is it puts into place, one, um, the full access rights and responsibilities to the underlying land, just like any other homeowner. And then secondly, this resale formula. Um, so when they go to sell their home, they, we can provide them with a maximum resale price. That maximum resale price is based on um, the market appraisal. And so we, they do a market appraisal when they buy it and another one they, when they want to sell it. We look at the appreciation over that time and a quarter of that appreciation can be tacked on to their initial sales price. So if the home goes up by $100,000, we can tack on $25,000 to what they paid. And in that way, they're able to build wealth with that. And of course, everything that they're paying down in their mortgage, because unlike rent, they're building equity as they're making those payments. Um, and so the, in, those, in those two ways, they're able to begin to build wealth, um, but it's limited so that that next buyer, we know that that formula will make it so it's affordable to someone also under 80% of the area median income at that time. Thank you. I think that, that was explained to us before, but it was just helpful to have that refresher. And then uh, if, they, if they sell or if they have to leave quickly, is there any repayment that they would have? You know, for example, they lost a job and they could only find a job, you know, out of town or something like that. Would there have to be a repayment then of the $25,000 or whatever the down payment is? Or So it depends if they have down payment assistance, that would depend on whatever down payment assistance they have, which would be out of our scope. Um, for ours, though, um, the faster you sell a home, the less likely you are, obviously, to make any profit on it. Um, and with the cost of closing costs and things like that, it is possible you could lose money if you sold within, you know, six months or something like that. Um, the, the limited number of resales that we've had, though, everyone has... Um, you know, been able to gain appreciation that they're able to take with them into their next home. Great. Well, thank you for your work. I really support this. Uh, thank you to Aaliyah for bringing this forward. I think this is a, you know, we, we talk about this sort of missing middle housing that, you know, is, is home ownership for folks that had what I used to say were previously middle-class jobs where you could easily afford a home, which now are just, you know, that, that doesn't happen. And so I think this really fills in that gap and I appreciate your work in this space. Thank Thanks. you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Stevens. Stefka, it's really nice to meet you. Um, this is a really exciting project, um, and I appreciate Leah bringing this forward, and I think Josh also championed it as well. And, uh, you know, um, as Commissioner Stevens stated, we really wanted to look at all the housing needs, and we still have a lot of work to do in the missing middle or, you know, obtainable housing for folks. And, and it is the gap that um, that we're able to, you know, get into the housing market and be able to afford a home. I always wonder if my children will able be, ever be able to afford a home. Mm -hmm. And um, and it is a, st a step into, um, you know, kind of that wealth building and be able to, you know, move on and, and uh, purchase a home. And I know, you know, my husband bought a town home way back when, and that was him and his brother bought it together. And that was their step into um, home ownership as they went on. And, and that's why we're homeowners now, but you know, it's been a, a lot of work and a lot of time. And I know those were because of some of these programs that, um, you all have, you know, um, so, th uh, 
diligently and passionately supported and helped, you know, keep rolling. So I'm very excited about this. I, I really look forward to coming and seeing it. Um, appreciate you explaining it too, how our American Rescue Plan dollars of a million dollars is going to kind of fill that gap. That was really helpful. And also to explain that to the, the public and their, our taxpayers about what, how we're using this to kind of, um, fill that gap and how this is important for um, our working families in this community, for them to be able to live in the communities that they work. It's, it's, it's such a critical need. And um, I appreciate um, your expertise in this space and explaining and naming all the partners um, with Fort Collins and TWG um, and the Impact Development Fund, all these people that have to come together and work together um, to, you know, for this mission and this value. And, and uh, it's uh really just amazing, outstanding work. And I'm very excited um, to, um, to, I can't wait to see it and see a completion. Um, so thank you. And thank you to your team and all the partners for your diligent and hard work. And appreciate you guys being here today. And thank you as we try to write out and change that um, change in our, um, our agenda. And so um, Leah, did you have anything else to add? Otherwise, we'll just make a motion and move on but Thank you. yeah oh I'm sorry Lorena do you have anything else you wanted to add other than that change you know I guess I want I want to give former manager Linda Hoffman credit for this transformational project discussion um, these happened early on um, she convened a group along with the Bohemian Foundation to identify projects that all the organizations might get behind this is the fruit of one of those discussions and so um, I don't want to leave her out of this celebration. This is really great work that she began, that Laura continued, that Aaliyah picked up with, and now here we are with a grant agreement, um, and these houses are under construction. So um, I just can't say enough good things about that work that was done early on to identify these big transformational ways to use these federal dollars in our community that will last um, a lifetime. Thank you, Lorenda. I'm glad that you brought that up. And thank you to Linda and, Sh and Cheryl, because they did do a lot of work behind the scenes that was instrumental to providing the foundation and brought these projects forward. So, um, and we get the, you know, we get the easy part. We just get to vote on it. So, um, but it's, um, I, it's, it's, tra it is transformational. So this is exciting. So um, we'll move on to our motion. I'll ask Commissioner Gafalas to make that motion, please. Thank you. Thank you all. I move to approve the grant agreement American Rescue Plan Collaborative Projects Grant subaward in the amount of one million dollars, with the understanding that the agreement will need to be uh, updated to reflect the proper amount. Thank you, Commissioner, for that motion. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, um, with that, the motion on the table. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Three to zero. Congratulations, and we, and we look forward to seeing this project soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you all so much. For and thank you, Aaliyah us. and Josh and everyone else involved. So moving on to our, um, our agenda, we have two more items. We've had a lot of discussion items today, so thank you for everyone hanging out and um, learning and walking down memory line and celebrating these amazing projects. We have our county manager update. Hello, thank Lorenda. You. Thank you, Commissioners. I'm going to keep it really short and just say um, how excited we are that we'll be hosting the Community Leaders Summit tomorrow. Um, about 100 leaders across our community have agreed to come help us identify the major issues facing the county and our residents. Um, and so tomorrow morning, we'll spend a few hours with those folks and, and learn what they have to say. So um, I think I'll keep it at that today. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenda. I am looking forward to that summit tomorrow. And so um, appreciate all that. Colleagues, you have any questions for Lorenda? Commissioner Confalis. Yes, uh, could you say something about the could you say something about the community survey that will follow the summit? Uh, for those who may not be able to participate, there are other ways of providing us input regarding our next um, the iteration of our next five year strategic plan. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. So um, Pretty shortly after the summit is held, our uh, public affairs office will be sending out our typical community survey that we do. There'll be some extra questions this year so folks can identify issues that they may want to raise. And then we will take the information from the Community Leaders Summit and dovetail it with that community survey information to make sure that we have all of the issues to consider going forward. So thank you for that reminder. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Stevens, any other things, questions you want to ask? Okay. So now we'll move on to our com commissioner activity reports. I know we all kind of were um, all a lot of the same events um, and it was quite the busy week. Um, so I will start with Commissioner Stevens. Yeah, given the time, I'll be brief. So um, I just on Thursday attended the NACO Transportation Committee and uh, went over resolutions for the upcoming National Association of Counties Conference. Um, I guess uh, in, in quick summary, um, these resolutions will both look out for county assets and also uh, look for ways to bring in federal dollars um, for um, directly to the counties. Uh, Commissioner Kafalis and I had a community conversation uh, Alex Jordan was present from the budget office. He did a wonderful job explaining um, how some of the upcoming uh, ballot initiatives and prospective ballot initiatives might uh, affect both folks' taxes and the county budget. And so we had a great discussion with um, a handful of uh, residents from the community. And I think that that was, I hope everybody um, takes the opportunity to kind of look and see um, how um, Proposition HH would affect both um, your own pocketbook and um, the ability for the county to do its business. So we'll have more um, information and more opportunities for people to learn about that um, coming up in this fall. Um, then on Friday toward the Carnegie Building with the Downtown Development Authority. We are, um, Downtown Development Authority is one of the uh, funders for some of the outside work that's being done. It's a great historic building. Um, the back half of which was uh, created during the th 30s and 40s um, by the WPA. And so um, there, it's a treasure trove of sort of things that they're finding as they do a lot of demolition on that building. And, and, but it will be a beautiful space for the arts and, arts and culture in our community. And so i um, grateful to have that tour from Jim McDonald from the city of Fort Collins. And um, they've received a lot of grant dollars, so they've been able to really use some of the dollars that DDA and the city gave them to really leverage a lot of uh, grant dollars. And so it, it will be a remarkable space. And then finally, just wanted to say that on Saturday, I attended the Glen Haven um, Pancake Breakfast, which was uh, for the uh, Glen Haven Volunteer Fire Department. Great event, a lot of people in attendance. I think they raised, I think I saw on Facebook that they raised at least $28,000, which is a remarkable amount. And I will say that the fire chief was, um, Volunteer Fire Chief was talking uh, about how he appreciates so much the relationship with Larimer County that he has that he had previously worked in upstate New York and uh, their relationship with uh, his fire department's relationship with local government was not as strong and didn't he didn't feel as supported as he does. So um, remarkable work from the county to be able to do that. Um, appreciates all the work that's been done on the flooding there in Glen Haven. And thank you to Commissioner Shattuck McNally for um, building those relationships as well. And then attended NOCO Pride. Um, we have our Pride Festival in Fort Collins a little bit later than uh, other folks, but um, always a great celebration. Great to see community partners out there. And thank you for everyone who sponsored that event. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stevens, and thank you for the, your work in the community. Uh, I know you've been doing a lot of work with uh, air quality and transportation, and I appreciate that. Commissioner Kofalis. Thank you, Madam Chair. In light of the time, I'm going to pass since some of the events uh, have already been discussed. And also, I have an off-site meeting at noon, so I will pass on my commissioner activity report. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to go ahead and do my report if you feel you... You need to go ahead and exit and leave to make your meeting on time. I will um, be okay with that. Um, I know um, maybe Commissioner Stevens and I shared some of the events, but I'd like to share a little bit about what um, my week was like. Um, so um, last week, you know, we were getting ready for our 75th an um, anniversary of the rodeo and the 140th anniversary of the fair and the 20th anniversary of our uh, Larimer County Ranch Complex. And, and Commissioner Stevens and I serve as liaisons for the fair and rodeo board. And I'm on the rodeo board, and um, the rodeo board is working really hard as we have these details to put on this really nice production of the rodeo. As you, uh, we mentioned in the past, there are going to be new seats, and the suites are already getting done. The ranch um, team is working tirelessly and hard to get kind of the inside 
outside ready to go. And one thing I've failed to mention is the rodeo board really had, we had a lot of conversations, the prize money for the uh, the cowboys and folks participating in the rodeo hasn't been raised in like over a decade. And so they've worked diligently to look at that budget. And so this is our first year we're going to have increase in prize money, I believe to 7,500 per event is I think that's the name. That, yeah. And so um, that will also help keep us, you know, maintain, retaining um, big acts and people and these really big cowboys come um, to, to our rodeo. So it is part of our heritage and, and, and um, traditions. And it's, I just wanted to thank them for the work because they do really deeply care about the, the fair and rodeo. So um, I wanted to just share that for those who are kind of tuning in. Um, I have um, just a lot of going on. Um, Commissioner Stevens had her NACO um, steering committee. I had mine also this week. We're both going to the National Association of Counties Conference this week. Um, I attended our meeting because I sit on the Rural Action Caucus. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of work and ha um, having some big presentations. I also sit on the Environment, Energy, and Land Use um, Steering Committee. And we had our call yesterday talking about um, all these resolutions, which were a lot, talking about PFAS and coal slash yards and um, downstream water pollution air quality it's it's there's a lot of resolutions that we kind of preview before our meeting next week and um, I'm still trying to um, see how we can put in there's some counties that put in multiple resolutions and that's something I'm going to try to see what we can do for Colorado to kind of put in our own resolution for next year because it seems to um, to be a lot of voices um, going forward for that and I'd like to see make sure we can get something in for our our, our state also, I attended the, um, I've been very honored to be asked by NACO to present on Sunday for the safeguarding our communities to talk about um, resiliency and building um, uh, uh, kind of sustainability for these natural disasters for counties. How, what, what are we doing? Unfortunately, um, it's myself, Houston, Texas, County Harris, Texas, and then West Green County, West Virginia who all have seen some pretty um, substantial natural disasters. Um, unfortunately, Larimer County has had a lot the last few years. And as we mentioned again today, the Lawn Lake flood in 1982. Um, but we've done a lot um, to build resiliency and, and have this recovery. So uh, we've been really working hard to prep along with um, Sonoma County, which had, I think, the Paradise Fire and some of that, they're going to be moderating the panel. So. It's quite the honor. So there's been a lot of work that week trying to get ready for that conference. I want to just thank the Planning Commission. We had a joint meeting last week, and I really talked about some new things as we went. As we talked about housing, we got a grant from the Department of Local Affairs. We went through our whole land use code and looked at kind of barriers that we have in that, the code that might be making it harder to do a housing our housing needs and and it was a really great discussion and we had kind of the end of the the outside consultant who was looking at this and it was a really great discussion and the, the work and and the service from the planning commission is is very valuable and I thought it was a fantastic um, discussion and thank you Commissioner Stevens um, we we had a late night that night it was a long meeting but I think it was really valuable so um, on the on the, um, it we I could go through all the means, but I'm just going to cover some high things. We had um, uh, just a nice conversation. Weld County and Commissioner James came over to talk to um, Lori Cadrich, our assistant county manager, and Laura Walker from Economic and Human Services, and we they wanted to learn more about the work that we had done for our behavioral health initiative and and how we're opening this building. And that was a great discussion. And and um, you know, Weld County brought their human services director over, and and they were very inquisitive and in really wanted to learn from us. And I thought that was really a nice conversation for bridging kind of um, how we can work together as a region. And we had our Office on Aging Advisory Council meetings and uh, we welcomed all the new men members at that meeting and they had ice cream social. I want to thank Shane Atkinson for coming. I wanted to introduce them to them. He's um, They're very active in legislation and really follow things at the state capitol. And Commissioner, if you need to leave, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and um, they're doing some um, interesting work and they're going to ask, um, have our budget team come present to the Office on Aging Advisory Council, which will be helpful. And then um, we had a chance to meet with some of our federal partners, which was, you know, Congressman Neguse is always so um, 
so helpful and it's great to have these meetings. On um, Friday, I chair the um, Forest, Colorado Forest Health Council um, Legislative Committee meeting and we have been meeting weekly to um, come together with some ideas as we're going to present to the full council on the 27th. Um, our legislative uh, agenda for next year, we were very successful with our legislative agenda this year with Senate Bill 5 and also supporting the nursery bill. And so um, that was a really important meeting. And then um, I joined the Colorado County's Incorporated Proposed Discussion Issues. Um, that was, a, it actually was very interesting. It was um, almost to the minute till three o'clock. It was a six hour meeting, but um, these counties have been really doing their homework and presenting these um, issues and things. We presented on a couple that we had. Um, it was a great, really great discussion and I appreciate um, all the commissioners hanging in there and having those, that, um, that time. I did jump out for just an hour or so. I joined Department of Natural Resources and our new, um, well, she's not new so anymore, but our Community Planning Infrastructure Research Director. We went up to Soapstone um, to look at the baby bison. I know I think there's a different name for them, but I try to go up there and see them every year. Um, usually they're very curious around the car, but this time they were have not having it. They moved off and, and it was another successful year of 100% birth rate as last year. And we talked about the partnership with Soapstone Red Mountain and CSU and how important all those partnerships in. So you can go to the Laramie um, Bison Conservation Herd um, on, on websites, on our website, Fort Collins website and CSU website. It's a great partnership. But we also talked about some of the mitigation work, um, the river restoration work up there and, and the mitigation projects from a former hayfield and things and the work that we're doing there that it might seem small, but actually it's going to have a big impact with watersheds and thing in that area. And we drove by the bee dams and box elders. So that was interesting to, to kind of be reminded of that. And then um, uh, we had another tour. I took some um, state legislator and tried to get some folks as we took another really brief tour of the behavioral health cell building. They, the lights are on, the penance being held. There's uh, putting some, a lot of final touches and I'm getting very excited about September 26th. 22nd, excuse me, when we have our, our grand opening, or, not, or our ribbon cutting. Um, I was really grateful to, um, to be able to go up to Estes Park. I had a brief meeting um, in Estes and then ran down to the Glen Haven Fire Department pancake breakfast. It's my seventh year going. It's always really a great time. Um, I really appreciate uh, Chief Kevin Zagorda's work and his team. They do a lot of work to train the volunteer fire department and do a lot of mitigation work and have these um, community building events and you know that pancake breakfast is actually I want to get this right the data um, it's almost 20% of their budget and so it's a really important day and the community all comes together I would say there's easily 300 people that come to this breakfast and and it's just a, a fun event and the, the amount of work that goes into that I can't imagine but kudos to them and their community um, for a fantastic event and bringing their community together, um, especially for folks that maybe um, only are there part time of the year. So that was a lot of fun. And then we came down and I went to the Pride, spoke at Pride and walked every booth. It was great to talk to all the vendors and all the partners and think. And we had two Lerma County tables and that was exciting to um, to thank them. One was from Behavioral Health and one was from Department of Natural Resources. And then just talked to a lot of the advocates and folks that organized that. So um, NOCO um, uh, Equality um, Group, thank you for your hard work and diligence for having this safe space in this event and to celebrate Persist in the Pride was this year's theme. And we saw a lot of community partners and it was great to see um, Representative Andrew Basenecker from HD 53 and, and Representative um, Kathy Kipp from HD 52 and um, and just a lot of folks, a lot of people from City Fort Collins and it was really a joyful event. Then I went down to um, the 100 years of, of service for the Loveland Fire Authority. Um, they were celebrating, can think about that, a fire um, authority being in, in the community as long as the community has been around. It's 140 years of service, and they had their drones out, and they had all the old fire stations, and other departments brought their antique fire uh, stations, and um, they showed... Um, uh, had some demonstrations on, uh, had an actual fire where they were putting the fire out and showing a difference between a full hose worth of sprinkle. They did an evacuation event where they had a crushed car and how they would extract someone and get the doors off. And it was well received. 
two blocks away at the same time was the Loveland's Cherry um, celebration, and it was um, well attended, a very large group, lots of vendors, lots of community um, opportunities for kids to get involved and lots of live music. And of course, the line for Cherry Pie from Colorado Cherry Company was long. Um, I can just drive from there from my house 10 minutes. So I thought I'm not sitting in the line for 30 minutes to get a pie. I'm just going to go home and drive up and get a pie. But it was a lot of fun. There were a lot of pies, and a lot of fun and great um, great job by that community for the work that they do. And, you know, just wanted to kind of really carefully uh, mention from yesterday, um, we had our budget retreat, but we did also a tour with the Behavioral Health Policy Council of the Women's Correctional uh, they, uh, Facility New Wing and, and did a tour of community justice alternatives and had a panel from some women with lived experience. And I want to thank our community partners from the city of Windsor, of Wellington, Windsor, um, and Fort Collins, um, and um, some of our other pimp folks who serve on our policy council who came and attended and took some time out to, to come in and learn more. And it was really a well done. Thank you to Emily Humphrey and, and Jill Fox and Tim Han for just as always being outstanding. So with that, um, I will, I think that's all I have. I just wanted to share, um, there's a really cool things and I, I also do this to kind of inform the public, but also share with my colleagues the things that I'm doing so that they, I know a lot of things we were at the same I, things, but also I wanted to share some of the other things that happen in the community. So thank you, Commissioner Stevens, for letting me share my, my week. Um, with that, um, I don't think we have any other items on our agenda. So at 11.54, we are adjourned. Thank you.